call a meeting to order. <laughs> Rob, would you please lead us in the pledge? It's over here, guys. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Victor, would you lead us in prayer tonight, please? Father God in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've allowed us to be in today. God, we ask that your perfect will will be done in tonight's meeting. Lord, give us wisdom and insight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Anita, roll call, please. Councilor Foster. Present. Councilor Locke. Here. Councilor Lorenz. Here. Mayor Pertem Cibola. Here. Mayor Becker. Here. The quorum is declared. Do you have any modifications to the agenda? No, sir. Approval of cons consent agenda, minutes of regular meeting from May 19th, 2022, and a review and approval of accounts payable. Move to uh, approve the minutes of the regular meeting of May 19th and the accounts payable. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Minutes of regular meeting from May 19th, 2022 and review and approval of accounts payable. Is there any more discussion? Anita? Councilor Foster? Aye. Councilor Locke? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the consent agenda. Okay. So does some comments. City Council welcome during scheduled comments. Please limit comments to three minutes. Council will not take action at this same meeting. Anybody? In group. All right, we'll move on to scheduled appearances. <clears throat> First one we have is request to have a farmer's market at the Facet parking lot, and I'm assuming that would be Chelsea. Good to see you, Chelsea. Good, uh, Chelsea. Nice <laughs> being here on the regular. Don't miss having to talk in public, though. <laughs> Um, so, if any, I'm sure all of you know me by now, but just for the record, my name is Chelsea Martinez. I'm the co-manager of the Monta Vista Farmer's Market. So we've scheduled our dates this year with your approval from July the 8th through September the 16th on Fridays from 9 to 1 in the Facet parking lot, and if you guys approve us being there. Um, we're having much the same plan this year as last year with fewer restrictions. Hopefully everything stays that way. We're just working with public health to make sure that there's nothing else that we're going to do um, differently or anything else that we have to add at the last minute, but so far so good. Uh, we're going to try to have live music again this this year. Our restrictions the last couple of years were just too difficult. I had to have a space with uh, 11 feet circumference between, before, between the performer and the next person, and it was just too much last year. So. Hopefully this year it'll work out better. We can have um, live music again. Um, we are expecting a lot of the same vendors and a couple new vendors this year. We've been getting a lot of uh, feedback on social media. Um, just a little uh, snippet of what we did last year. Um, in city sales tax, the farmer's market in total last year paid $735.02. And then of course we paid county and state tax as well. I can let you guys know that if you would like. Um, we did. Uh, we distributed $1,048 in SNAP uh, vouchers and $680 in double up vouchers. So just a quick overview of what those are. These ones are SNAP vouchers. So people with the SNAP card, we have a uh, machine set up that they come and run their card and then we give them however much they would, would prefer in these vouchers and they can spend these with the vendors. The vendors then turn them in to me at the end of the day and that pays, I pay them back same as cash and then we'll reimburse for those. Now the double up food buck vouchers are a little bit different. So this is a specialized grant program and it matches up to $20 a week in SNAP benefits. And these can only be used on fresh fruits and vegetables or certain dried products like dried beans. And then of course our market box, we just kind of, we distribute as a promotional 
um, to various people that come in, or I tried to do like a, a photo contest last year for some market dollars, and like a get to meet your vendor, um, get to meet your vendors contest. So um, my focus this year is I really want the customers to have more opportunities to connect with local growers and the local people that are going to be there, the local vendors that are going to be there, so they can kind of understand a little bit more about what goes into the products that, are, that they're buying there. So I think um, Tumbleweed Bread did a great job of that last year, and hopefully they come again this year. I'm under the impression that they were planning on it. So... They, they did a good job of like re outreach and explaining their processes and things like that. So hopefully we can have a little bit more about that and people can better connect with um, their food and the arts and crafts that we have as well. Um, do you have any questions for me or anything I forgot? <coughs> well, we just need to prove this. I would move that we approve Monta Vista Farmers Market request to use the parking lot uh, at First Avenue and Jefferson Street for the 2022 market season. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the Farmers Market using the parking lot at First and Jefferson from July 8th through September 16th. Is there any more discussion? May I make a comment, Mr. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> so the only thing that uh, we would request, Chelsea, is that um, they're painting a mural on that wall. Oh, okay. And so just to make sure you give the artist enough space, uh, we, he hopes to be completed by Stampede, but they've started on it already, so. That's gonna look nice. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess the other thing too would be the city helps cover um, the booths that use electricity there. So if there's an extra expense or something with that, we can look at that. Um, this is the last year that we're going to be under the grant that we were before, and then it'll be back to volunteer and only what the what the market generates basis. But we can try and see if there's something in the budget if the city needs reimbursement for the electricity. No. No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Okay, you need a Councillor Foster? Aye. Councillor Luff? Aye. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sedola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the farmers market July eighth through September sixteenth on Fridays from nine to one at the Fast parking lot. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. This is going to be a fun discussion. 2021 audits, Logan and Associates. So I'm going to slide this over a little bit. I can kind of see what's behind me. All right. All right, so my name's Kyle Logan. I'm the uh, owner of Logan and Associates, the independent auditors, uh, certified public accountants for the city. And I'm here this evening to present the results of the city's financial statements audit for the year ended December 31st, 2021. And so I know you all received the, the uh, financial statements electronically, so, so that's good. And, this will be the first year of us uh, present showing it this way, so I kind of this is kind of new to me too. So um, anyway, we we uh, performed the audit in two phases basically. We came out, uh, I believe, around December seventh, and that's where we do a lot of preliminary stuff where we pick samples of cash disbursements, payroll, utility billings, and we look at the internal controls of the city for all these processes and we look at procedures and policies that have been put in place. And so we're making sure that, you know, the, perhaps the money that's going out, either in terms of payments to vendors or payments to employees, have proper authorization, proper approvals, and are recorded in the uh, financial accounting records properly. Um, we also do some preliminary comparisons of balances as of 12:31. 2021 compared to 2020. 
Um, and uh, we also look at some, uh, as far as the minutes, look at new uh, contracts, new agreements that might have a financial impact on the city. And then um, that kind of co covers our preliminary work. And then at the year end, that's where we concentrate on the financials and on the numbers that you, you see in the financial statements. And so we send out confirmations to like banks, um, to the uh, organizations that the, the city has loans or debt with. Also, we confirm certain revenue streams, sales tax, property taxes, franchise taxes, mm -hmm. and, and compare that to what's been recorded in the accounting records to see that, you know, if, if that gives us a, a good understanding of the financial statements, as well as giving me comfort in order to issue an opinion on the financial statements. And so the financial statements, all the statements, all the footnote disclosures in this document, they're responsibility of the city's management. Our responsibility is to audit those and issue an opinion. And so as we, ha we have up here um, on the right side, there is an independent auditor's report. And so that format has changed this year from previous years. And I actually like this newer format because it puts the opinion at the very first where before it was in like either the second or third page. So, so I like this being at the very front, um, those t uh, top two paragraphs. And so for the year ended, December 31st, 2021, the city received an unmodified opinion. Now in layman's terms, that's a clean opinion. That is the best that the city can receive from an independent audit. What that tells you as a city council that tells you that all the numbers in this document, all the footnote disclosures in this document are fairly stated and materially correct in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles for a local government entity. So again, that's the best that you can, you can receive. Okay, so then following the independent auditor's report, if you'll scroll down uh, one more page, is the uh, management's discussion and analysis. And these pages here, basically, this is a, kind of a written narrative of certain things that have occurred over the past year and, and certain activities related to revenues and expenses um, of the city. And it also, um, at a high level, compares 21 with uh, 2020, okay? And so, again, it's, it's just something that's required. Uh, years ago, the accounting standards for local governments wanted uh, local governments to basically report uh, certain things similar to like a publicly traded company. So that's that's the purpose of the, the management's discussion and analysis. Okay, so if we scroll through that, um, you got a few pages to go, you need a... <laughs> okay, now we're at the, go down one more, we're at the basic financial statements. And so the basic financial statements, um, are, are pages one through nine. The first two pages are um, the statement of net position and statement of activities. And what these are, these are um, showing all of the city's funds combined into either governmental activities or business type activities. Your business type activities, that's your water and sewer funds, okay? Governmental activities, that's your general fund and all your other funds. And what this reporting does this is how a business or a public company would report their financial statements on what's called a full accrual basis, okay? And so really you only see this reporting at the, at the year end when, when we uh, present the uh, financial statements, okay? Um, and so what I'll point out, what I like about this is it shows everything of the city in one page. And as of December 31st, this is like a snapshot picture of all the assets of the city, all the liabilities or claims against those assets, and the net position or net worth. And so for 12-31-2021, uh, uh, your total assets were $31.5 million. That's about an $8.8 .8 million uh, increase over 2020. Now, the majority of that is... Um, is in the uh, uh, sky high complex the the completion of that 
but you also had a pretty significant increase in your cash and investments, um, primarily from sales tax revenues, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, and so of your total assets, um, your cash and investments, the top two lines there, at just a, about 6.6 .6 million, that makes up 21% of your total assets. And then your capital assets, um, that's about 22 and a half million, which makes up 72%. So those two categories make up, you know, 93% of the city's assets. Um, and again, the capital assets, they increased by about 6 million. The majority of that is related to the, the sky high uh, complex being, being pretty much complete by the end of the year. So then the next uh, section there is your uh, liabilities. Total liabilities, they're about 8.4 million. This is about a 2.8 million increase over, over last year. Um, significant part of that is your accounts payable, um, about 757,000, which that's a, a, a large increase because there were some payables at the end of the year that related to the Sky High Complex that weren't paid until 2022. And so they, because they related to December and November, we booked those back, okay? Um, the other part is there's a line, a new line on there called unearned revenue, uh, 461,000. That's basically the ARPA money that the city received. That's the amount that wasn't spent at the end of the year. I know the city spent a, a small portion of it in 2021. And so you have, you have till uh, December, of 2024 to spend that. And of course the city will be receiving the second tranche here this year sometime. Uh, I'm not, I haven't heard yet when it's coming, have you? Mm -hmm. So probably around June maybe. So you'll be receiving yeah. the second amount of that, okay? And again, there are some certain restrictions on how that money can be spent. Um, and then the other section, the biggest part of your liabilities are your, is your long-term debt and that's about 6.9 million. We had a net increase of about 1.6 million over last year. And so uh, the biggest part of that increase is the, the two and a half million dollar uh, loan uh, or lease purchase agreement that was taken out um, that uh, related to the Sky High complex. And so that'll be paid down, which the city is receiving basically a donation each year to, to make the payments on that. So that's nice. Okay, so then we get down to the net position or net worth of the city. So for, for all the governmental activities and business type activities, you're about 22.8 million. That's about 5.4 million or 31% increase over the last year. The majority of that is, is in your invested in net investments in your capital assets of about 15.6 million. Restricted monies, and so you're restricted these are monies that have been restricted either by a state law or statute or um, an outside uh, restriction. And so there, uh, your restricted net position about two million, but then your unrestricted that has no strings attached to it is 5.1 million. And so that's split between, you know, your governmental activities is about 3.2 million. Your business type activities is about, uh, 1.9 or, or 2 million of that. And so if we were to look at that unrestricted piece there and compared it to the expenses on page two um, to kind of get an idea of, well, how much do we have in operations? Your governmental activities could operate 10 months if all the expenses were the same as, as what we're gonna see here on page two in a minute. So, you know, that's not too bad. So what that means is, you know, if for whatever reason, the revenue streams dried up, the city could sustain for 10 months, okay? Your water and, and sewer uh, activities, you actually have about one year worth of operations in, in that, so, so that's pretty good, okay? But again, keep in mind, the unrestricted monies, you know, you guys have control of that if you want to designate some of it or commit some of it for, for certain projects or things, you're allowed to do that, okay? But that's what's carried over into 2022. All right, so that kind of covers the, the 
statement and that position. The next one, this is the statement of activities. And so this statement uh, flows on the two pages and it basically starts at the left with expenses and then goes over to program revenues and then flows down to the bottom right of your general revenues. And so your, pro your, your program revenues, these are revenues like charges for services, grants or donations that the, that the city receives that are specific to one of the programs, whether it's the general government, public safety, public works, et cetera, okay? And so your, your uh, governmental activities expenses, basically your governmental funds, about 3.9 million, which is very comparable to 2020, okay? Um, business type is about 1.9 million. Again, very comparable to 2020. So, you know, with, with uh, 2020 being the COVID year um, and 2021 kind of finishing up with that, you know, you guys have kind of watched your, your spending. So that's, that's good, okay? Your program revenues, the governmental, um, are about 4.6 million. Most of that is related to the, the donations and the contributions for, for the Sky High Complex. Your business type is about 2.6 million. And again, that's a slight increase over last year, which that's mostly your, your user charges um, that you bill your customers and your residents for, for water and sewer, okay? So then we get down to this, to this right side here, the, the general revenues. And of course, the biggest line there is your, your sales, sales and use taxes. And when we look at that, you know, that's about three and a half million. It's about a $523,000 increase or 18% increase over last year. And one thing I've noticed with my, with my municipal clients is I'm seeing this increase. Um, it kind of started when, uh, when COVID happened, people stayed home and started ordering stuff online. And so, so that's, that's continuing. And, and um, you know, that, that's a good thing because now that uh, when uh, Colorado was able to start collecting sales tax, uh, which was a couple years ago, um, you know, you're, you're getting the benefit of those, those purchases being made by, by residents, okay? Your franchise um, revenues, about 199,000. That's about a 17% increase over last year. Um, and then um, we also have in there uh, uh, the, uh, in the miscellaneous, that's 619,000. A lot of that is related to the money received for the, related to the lease payment that was made for uh, 2021. And so then we end up with a net income governmental activities of about 5.3 million, which increased your net position by 46%. And your uh, business type or water and sewer about 152,000, okay? And so, so again, this is presented as if the city was operating like one of your businesses here in town, okay? So now if we move on to page three, this is the balance sheet of the governmental funds. This is what you guys are used to seeing throughout the year. It's uh, what we call modified accrual basis of accounting. And so the way it's presented is that there's, there's certain <coughs> thresholds that make a fund uh, be determined as a, what we call a major fund. That's your general fund, your one cent sales tax fund, your capital projects fund, and your capital improvements fund, okay? And then uh, in, over on the right, the other governmental funds, that's all your other funds that are combined into, into that one column which we have a combining schedule later on in the, in the financial statements. So your total assets for your governmental funds, 6.4 million, increase of about 2.4 million or 59% or over last year. Of that, um, cash and investments makes up 5 million of your <coughs> governmental funds assets. And that's about a 2.1 million increase. So the majority of the increase in your assets is in your cash and investments, so that's a good thing. Okay, um, your total liabilities are about 1.2 million. Um, again, that's, that's a, a significant increase over last year. A lot of that, part of it is related to the payables related to Sky High Complex, which I mentioned. And then also that 461,000 of the, of the unearned uh, 
ARPA grant that you will have available to spend in this next year, okay? So then it comes down to fund balance. And so this is your, your net worth of each fund. And so the total fund balance is about 4.7 million. You know, of that, the, the restricted is about 2 million or 42% of it. You're committed and assigned, that's about 125,000. But then that leaves your unrestricted, which is all in your general fund of 2.6 million. Well, you know, I'd mentioned about the governmental activities having 10 months worth of expenditures. Well, this is just your general fund specifically. 2.6 million um, is about nine months worth of expenditures of the general fund. And that is if, you know, all the expenditures are the same from year to year. So again, that, that's pretty good for a general fund. Because then that, if, you know, something unforeseen happens, then the city has these funds available to either commit or assign for, for um, un unforeseen things, but also it's for you to carry over into the next year to help, help cover expenditures. Okay, so then um, the next page, uh, page four, I won't spend a lot of time that, on that. Basically what page four does, it reconciles the fund balance on page three to the net position on page one. Okay, page five is the, the next one. This is your statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Again, this is basically your net income or, or income statement that shows the net income or loss by, by your funds. And, you know, I'm happy to say that all your funds had net income this year. So that's good. That doesn't always happen. Um, and so, again, um, your total revenue is about $9.3 million. Um, a lot of the is about 2.1 million increase over 2020. Uh, most of that is in your your taxes, primarily sales and use taxes, and then also the uh, the intergovernmental and donations. So so um, re related to um, Sky High, you had a Dola grant that was relate that was received for the Sky High complex project, and then we also had the the FAA grant for the for the airport work that was done this past year, okay? Um, so again, they, these, these intergovernmental revenues, they'll kind of fluctuate from year to year depending on what projects the city has and what outside funding you're receiving for them. Um, total expenditures, about 10.7 million. That's a, about a $4.4 million increase over, over last year. Well, the significant piece of that is the completion of the Sky High Complex. So, so I expect that to drop this year in 2022 depending on what other projects get going this year. So, okay. So then that, the other thing down here, uh, near the bottom here, we show the two and a half million dollar of le uh, the, the lease proceeds that the city received. Um, so then that, uh, you know, ends, ends with a total net income for all the funds of about 1.2 million, which is a 35% increase in your fund balance, okay. Um, then page six, here on the left side, again, this is a reconciliation that reconciles the net income from page five to the net income on page two. And then um, page seven over on the right, this is your statement of, uh, not yet, uh, thank you. This is your statement on the proprietary funds or your water and sewer funds. Uh, basically your, your balance sheet, your snapshot picture at 1231 of all your assets, liabilities, and net position or net worth. And so again, total assets, uh, 9.1 million, very comparable to 2020, total liabilities of 3 million, a slight decrease over, over 2020. And then we have net position or net worth of 6.1 million, which is about a 2.5% increase over, over last year. So um, again, if we look at when, Concentrating on the, the unrestricted monies here, the 1.3 million for the water fund and the 593,000 for the sewer fund. We look at if we look at operations that are presented on on the the next page. Your water fund basically has 20 months worth of operations, and it's unrestricted. And your sewer has about seven months. Now you know you look at that and you think 20 months. Well, that's that's a long time, but you guys have a water main break or a water line break 
and just like that, it, it, that could be gone. So it's it's good to have that unrestricted amount in there for unforeseen things that that could happen. Okay. Um, let's see. Then if we scroll down another page over here on the left. Uh, statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position, basically your income statement. So your operating revenues were about 2.1 million, just a slight decrease over 2020. Your operating expenses were 1.9 million. Um, again, a slight decrease over 2020. And then your, so your operating income uh, is about 250,000 for the water fund and about 21,000 for the sewer fund. So your operations are, you know, are providing income, which that's good, because I don't always see that, and especially with water and sewer activities. Um, and so then we also have, uh, down near the bottom where the tap fees are, we have that. We also have um, in non-operating revenues, some grant revenue, which some of that is the ARPA money, I believe. And also then we also had, um, the uh, let's see, Energy Impact Assistance Fund grant related to the water and sewer uh, master uh, plan study that, that the, the city received to help offset some of those expenses. Um, the other thing is that these two funds, they, they transfer out um, about 99,000 each to the general fund to kind of kind of cover administrative type costs that aren't directly billed from the general fund to the two funds. And so that's something that during the budget process you guys approve. And, and so that transfer is made each year. Um, and so again, your net income, water fund, um, after all that, the water fund has about 188,000, but you had a slight net loss in the uh, sewer fund of about 36,000. And you know, a lot of that is, is related to the transfer out. But again, your sewer funds, operations are are creating income so that's good okay then the page over on the right this is a, a statement of cash flows for the um, water and sewer funds and so it's presented in in uh, four categories operating non-capital financing and um, capital and related financing and investing and so when i'm putting this together and coming up with my conclusions in order to issue an opinion. I'm looking at that top part, the, are your operations cash flowing? And they are. So your water fund had uh, cash flow about 311,000, your sewer fund had about uh, 371,000 cash flow. So that's good, that's, that's good that it's generating that amount because then that helps this next section there of the payment to the, to the general fund but it also helps with uh, your payment of your debt that's been issued over the years. And then any uh, purchases or uh, of capital assets, equipment or, or uh, you know, line, um, new lines or, or things like that, okay? So, so that's good. Um, you guys paid, paid down debt um, approximately 120,000. And, and again, those are scheduled payments that you make each year. So that, that amount's gonna be about the same. Um, each year it'll, it'll gradually increase as, as time goes. Um, but again, uh, your, your operations are cash flowing. So that's the, the biggest takeaway from this statement. Okay, so then the next section, this is the longest section, the footnotes, um, pages 10 through 37. And um, you need I'll probably go kind of fast, but uh, this, this first part here, note one, this is your summary of significant accounting policies. The accounting standards require certain things to be disclosed in the financial statements that one, either support numbers up in the statements that we already talked about, or just require disclosures. And so this, this note one, um, page, primarily pages 10 through 17, Cover, covers a lot of that, just relate different things that are required to be reported. But then starting on page 17, there at the bottom, and then you can scroll on one more, you need, um, is your cash and investments footnote. And so that tells you where, 
where all your cash and investments are um, invested or deposited, whether it's either in you know banks or whether you know a significant amount of it you have is in is in call of trust. Okay, you had about 1.1 billion in call of trust, but the majority of the rest of it is it is in the bank. Um, okay, and so again, this this tells you certain things that are that are required to be disclosed. Down in the lower right hand corner there um, talks about the restrictions on cash and investments. A lot of that's related to the to the debt. Um, there's certain requirements that that uh, money be kind of set aside to help uh, with future payments on the debt. Okay, and so then um, following on the next page, uh, note three is uh, the interfund transfers. So we already talked about the transfers between the water and sewer funds to the general fund. There are other transfers that happen, and so this footnote dis, uh, discloses and tells what those transfers are related to and why. And then on page uh, 21, 21 and 22, this is your capital assets. So again, this shows on 21, this is the governmental activities. On 22, business type or your water and sewer activities. So this shows all the you know, land, buildings, equipment that the city owns and then the related depreciation um, on, those, on those categories. Um, and then uh, on pages uh, 23 through 27, this is your long-term debt. And so again, the first part there on 23, this is your governmental activities, which basically is, is the, uh, has the, your capital leases, which includes that, that lease purchase that happened this year of the 2.5 million. But then we also had a, uh, the 2018 uh, sales tax revenue bond refunding that you guys are paying down. And um, there at the bottom shows the future debt requirements in 2028, that bond will be paid off. Okay. Um, and then over on the, on the next page, this is your, uh, your governmental act or your business type activities over here on 25. Um, and again, talks about all the, the water loans throughout the years that have been, um, you know, uh, take it out by the, the city in order to um, finance certain projects related to the water and sewer systems. And again, um, then continuing on 26 and 27, these are just more disclosures of the payments. And so the, the water and sewer loans will be paid off in 2048. Then um, pages 28 through 36, this is all your pension, pension plans. And so you have the, on, on 28 here, the, the defined contribution pension plan for, for basically all the, all the non-public safety or non-police employees um, is uh, administered through ICMA. And so really that's because it's defined contribution. There's not a lot of disclosure there. But then starting on 28 all the way to 36, this is all the FPPA. Uh, pension plans. Again, basically what it is is that because the, the plan is what's called a, a cost-sharing multi-employer pension plan, and so the, the city has a piece of that. And so the county standards require that either the pension liability or asset, in your case, is uh, reported up there on, on page one. Um, and so then it also requires all this additional disclosure. We auditors aren't a big fan of this um, because it's uh, sometimes it, it just seems like a, an exercise in futility to get through through this stuff um, because the numbers fluctuate so much from year to year and it's based on the actuaries that the city even doesn't even have any control over because it's all controlled by FPPA. But again, it's required by the accounting standards. So that's that's what these pages uh, cover. Um, and then on, on pages, uh, the last couple pages, 36 and 37, we talk about, you know, commitments and contingencies there. Um, you know, there because the Department of Public Health had issued that potential penalty, um, we put a disclosure there, just because right now we don't know what the outcome is. Um, and so, so we put that just to let the reader notice because if it wasn't in there and someone might be going, well, why don't we see this? OK, 
Okay. Um, and then also, I left the paragraph related to the coronavirus pandemic. It's technically, they haven't said it's over, but um, I have a feeling in 2022 we'll probably eliminate that disclosure, hopefully. And then we have a, the construction commitment of what's left, you know, on a, on a sky high immense complex related to that. Start out about 4.4 million uh, related to the one one company, not the entire project. And there's about 468,000 left at the end of December. Okay, and then uh, the one thing uh, there at the very end, we did uh, uh, restate some balances related to the Sky High project. Um, not a significant concern from our standpoint as the auditors, but it was just the timing of some of the payables and some of the receivables related to money that was paid out and money that was received uh, related to the Sky High project that should have been reported in 2020, but um, it, it was reported in 21, so we moved it back so that it was properly in the, in the proper period. Okay, so that kind of covers the, the footnotes. Everybody still with me? Okay, good. So then we get to the required supplementary information. And, and basically what this is, this is your general fund and your one cent sales tax fund uh, budgets because they're, they're two of the major programs uh, or major funds. Um, and then some FPPA uh, pension schedules that are required by the, the accounting standards. Um, and so, you know, as we go, as, as one thing from the audit standpoint, we look at all your budgets to see, one, are you, have you spent within what was budgeted or expected to be spent? Because that's, that's a state statute, that you're not allowed to overspend your budget. And so, so I know you guys made some amendments in order to, to properly reflect these additional expenditures. Uh, in some of the funds. So, you know, that's a good thing to not have to disclose anything about you guys overspending any of your funds. Um, so, I, I think in the past we had had a couple of times that we had to put that comment in just because of timing of things that had happened, but that's a good thing. So, keeps the state auditor from sending you a nasty letter, so that's nice. Um, pages 46 and 47, if you'll scroll down. Keep going, you're almost there. Okay, right here. Uh, this is a, you know, I talked about those non-major funds. These are your uh, non-major funds, Conservation Trust, uh, Urban Renewal, Kids Connection, and your grants funds. Again, we show this combining of this information to carry forward to page three. And then if you scroll down one more page, this here is basically the income statement that carries forward to page six. And so, so anyway, that's, that's uh, the total column over here is what you'll see on, on those front pages. And then following um, on pages 48 to 55, these are the rest of your budgetary comparison schedules for all your funds. That besides the general fund and the sales tax fund, okay? Or the one cent sales tax fund. So again, we, we look at these each year um, to, to make sure you're in compliance with statute. And then the last two pages, pages 56 and 57, is the local highway finance report. Uh, again, these are because you guys receive the highway users tax fund monies. Um, you're required to put this report in there basically to say how you're spending, spending the money. Um, and so again, that's, that's actually a required statute. We auditors, this, this is another, not one of our favorite things um, because every city calculates it different. So there's no consistency. So, but anyway, it's, it's in there. And uh, we, do, we do look at the numbers, how, how they're calculated and how it's reported. So that takes care of the financial statements. Um, any questions? I'd be amiss if I didn't ask something. <laughs> I wonder if you come up with something to ask. Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Well, of course I do. I always have something to ask on financial statements, right? Did um, I understand correctly, there's like a jillion numbers that go flying by. Um, did I understand correctly that the net income 
of the city, independent of sky high contributions and ARPA money contributions, was 1.2 million. Um, and if not, let me go back to that page. No. And if, and if um, not, what was the net income? So pulling those out. Yeah. So if, if we look on page five, I don't know if that's the page you're looking at there, but on page five, um, so your your net income overall was the 1.2 million, and if we were to pull out the 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 sky high project that is in the capital projects fund, which is that third column there, um, basically you're still like right around 1.1 million for all the all the funds. Your general fund had a, a net income of 717,000. So okay. the biggest piece of that net income is 717,000. Which would is have that, been- Does that help answer yeah, your that, question? Yeah, that, that, that answers my, that answers my, uh, Good. my question, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so then the, the other document that was in your packet is a, what I refer to as a management letter. And so our professional standards as uh, independent auditors require us to communicate certain things to you, the governing board or body of the city. And so the first part of this letter talks about my responsibilities under the uh, auditing standards. And then, you know, it, there's other things in here. Talks, this is a letter that if, <coughs> if we had huge changes in like accounting estimates, such as depreciation, um, if there were big changes in uh, accounting policies, which there were none, for uh, 21 um, significant audit adjustments we did make some some audit adjustments um, at the year end and so each year we we look at those adjustments and and the audit adjustments uh, were not significant enough for us to change our opinion on the financial statements so that's good and what that tells you as a council that tells you that most of the numbers you have seen throughout the year that have been provided in the packets is what you're seeing in this final audited document Okay, um, you know, if there were consultations with other independent accounts, as far as we know, there were none. Um, and then, you know, if we had any difficulties or issues uh, while performing the audit, um, well, if we did, you would have heard from me before tonight, so that's a good thing. And, you know, the, the other thing that this letter is, is used for is if, if there's areas for, you know, that we've come across during our audit that we recommend, uh, improvement on uh, or best practices type stuff then that's what we put in this letter and you know to show that there's nothing here what that tells you as the City Council that tells you that policies and procedures that have been put in place over the years and currently are being followed by city staff that also tells you that you have you know these policies and procedures in place that allow for good, sound financial reporting for a municipality. So that's good, okay? Because I know in my early years, we got quite a few comments that, that we made of, of things that, that needed to be changed, and they were. So, so that's, that's a good thing, okay? And then finally, I wanna thank Anita, Gigi, Rob, Unita, and the staff of the city you know, they have the hard part in all this process because they, especially this being your transition year, Anita, I really appreciate, you know, you come in and, and we didn't have many issues. You, we were able to get through things. So, so I appreciate your help because that, that made our job a lot easier as far as getting through everything. And that's all I have, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. So I also want to thank Kyle and his team for, for what they've done and, and the work. And we appreciate working with you and getting to know you a little bit. And Anita, you know, rock star coming in the middle of somebody else's work and somebody else's record keeping and pulling it all together. So there were days when her hair was on fire, but she but she always kept her cool. <laughs> so thank you, Anita. <laughs>
awesome. Thank you. We tried to take it easy, Your Honor. You <laughs> <laughs> may have a different spot, but anyway, so yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. See you next year. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming, to, driving, and doing it in person too. Oh, this is part of the hike. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you, yes, will need, uh, you will need a vote on accepting the 2021 audit. Okay. So I need a motion and a second. Make a motion to accept the 2021 audit. Seconded. It moved in seconded to accept the 2021 audit. Is there any more discussion? Anita? Councilor Foster? Aye. Councilor Locke? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sigala? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the 2021 audit. Discussion on a temporary moratorium on murals recommended by planning and zoning. Is this your presentation? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I will wing it. <laughs> so, Mr. Mayor and Council, it, it's been recommended by the Planning and Zoning Committee that you place some sort of a moratorium on the murals that are taking place around town. They are recommending a six month moratorium. Um, they believe that this needs to be in place for the purpose of, of making sure that in the freedom of expressing one's um, speech, that it is appropriate for our city. Um, and that's pretty much what it is. My recommendation is if you want to consider something that you look at a shorter time frame. Um, the chairman of planning and zoning, Ms. Spears, Sears, excuse me, contacted me again today and she said, you know, they don't want to dampen any of the spirit of what's going on but they're just concerned of what could appear. Um, I've, they want to go forth with the recommendation of, of those that I've already approved, which right now they're, they're doing one behind um, the, old, the facet building on the, the wall. That wall is owned by Jenna Ford. She gave her approval to do that, so there's gonna be um, or really something similar to what's on the front page of this little newspaper I gave you um, in celebration of Stampede and what that means to Monta Vista. We potentially have another location. They haven't got full approval yet, but I've seen what they want to paint, and it's quite lovely, and it's a, it's a Hispanic woman with lots of beautiful flowers and bees, and it's really cheerful and bright. And then we had a, um, a business that's coming to town that uh, is in the old Sears building where we're to the west of um, Stars. Stars on 2nd Avenue. What they've proposed is actually out of compliance, but I've said, nope, let's go forward and, and go ahead and use that. So in the spirit of the Planning and Zoning Committee, they're, they're not trying to overrule or overregulate or overly make this complicated. They're just trying to say, can we put some, a few parameters on this that says that somebody or some group or something gets to look at what's being proposed before it's just up there painted. I don't know, maybe we could defer to our new attorney on all of this as far as the, um, you know, what control do we have over commercial buildings or over residential buildings? You know, what, what is gonna prevent somebody from drawing giant daisies on their garage door if they wanted to do that? You know, how do we how would we stop that if we didn't like it that they painted a giant you know, swastika 
on it or something. So that's kind of the predicament we're in. There's one more building that I, I'm sorry, I just now recall that um, we gave a thumbs up to, and that is down on Asequia. Um, it's the glamp ground for Kelly Winter. Thank you for Callie. Um, Callie's glamour, glam, glamping um, commercial RV park down there, and she wants to paint something like big daisies and make it bright and welcoming and colorful. <clears throat> Not in county. Mm -hmm. Um, well, excuse me. It might be in county. Is that the, no, the it metal isn't. building or the <coughs> no. big building right off the hill? No, it's the one kind of right off the well, just a little past the hill. It's past. Um, you guys actually approved her RV park. It's the Glam Glamping Glam Grounds. Yeah, just north of the um, the highway. There you are. There, the Rio Grande County Urban Bridge Yard. Okay. Just north. Does any of this fall under the sign code? Yes and no. Like for the restaurant, that fell underneath the sign code as we interpret it. And, um, and Rob, you might have to help me remember. The sign code says you can't have more than one sign on your one building, and they've got the name of the building, the name of what their restaurant will be, and then it's a cute little toucan bird that's part of it down on the, the ground. And then they also have a have signage on the east side of their building. And that's technically not in compliance. So we asked them to kind of keep some of the sign code. The sign code only allows um, what's called one wall sign. Um, but since their property has basically two sides of frontage, they have a front and they also have a side um, they did do a good design, so we allowed them, and it's just paint, one wall sign that will protrude, and the rest of the signage is painted on the wall, and it fits the 150 square feet. So it says one sign not to exceed more than 150 square foot. So we have it so that all three signs, including the exterior, keeps it down to 150 square feet. What's the current process? Because you keep mentioning the fact that you're looking at the designs before they go up. Um, familiarize me with the process that they go through when they want to do this. So it was <clears throat> Councilman Foster is kind of kind of winging it. I'd say we were first contacted actually by Councilwoman Locke, who said, "I've got somebody that wants to paint something on the Elks Building, and what's the process?" I was like, mm, "I don't know." sounds like a great idea let's do it and um, and she told the lady that she needed to come in and just at least let me look at the picture and say yay or nay there's also if it was a sign there's a ten dollar sign fee application fee and so on this particular one um, probably all rules were broken I never actually did see it before it got painted and put up there and there was no application fee. So we told her that, and so then it's the same woman who's bringing forth the idea of the stampede uh, wall that's gonna go up. She has found outside, she paid for the first one at the Elks. She's found outside funders to pay for this second one, and then I've contacted a funder for the third one. Callie will be paying for her own. And the artist is out of Del Norte. Okay. So it sounds like P&Z is, and I, I don't know if you were at the meeting, so I don't know if you can speak to that. I don't know if, if Mr. Ferris was or not. They're looking for maybe a structure in terms of how we handle this situation, since, as you said, we're kind of in, in the dark at this point. Is that what P and Z is looking for, or are they just? You, were you at the you were at the meeting, weren't you? I was. Uh, if you want me to address that briefly, <clears throat> what we've got to be careful of here in uh, regard to murals. Murals are a form of speech, 
First Amendment. Uh, I sent everybody an entire chapter out of uh, the ABA publication on First Amendment speech and murals, basically, that I think everybody has by now. Rob made a very good point at uh, PNZ <coughs> that, you know, when we're all in concert together and we see these murals going up and everybody's really in approval of that, uh, they're great. They add a lot of color to the town, a lot of character, all of that. What we get into is um, when somebody wants to put up a mural that, let's say it has political overtones to it, it has uh, questionable, uh, uh, maybe not uh, obscenity or anything like that, but borderline, where do we draw the line? So <clears throat> I think the context of what we're going to do really requires an understanding of the parameters that we're dealing with for free speech and so forth. The last thing we want is constitutional challenges that we've got to address in this kind of thing. So I think the, uh, uh, and I appreciate what uh, Gigi is saying of, um, you know, maybe shortening this period a little bit because otherwise, you know, we're going to be into uh, the late fall or something like that before people would start painting again when it's really kind of too late to start painting. Uh, so perhaps uh, a shorter period, maybe at least three months so that we can look at all this and determine some rules that have been upheld as constitutional uh, as we proceed forward with the whole mural question. Um, so um, I, think, I think these comments are well taken and it is a, it, it's an interesting ground because it's art, really, that you're talking about. And uh, it does require some um, framework uh, and a legal framework for them <coughs> to proceed, and we can start working on that. And we do have some good source materials for that. I don't know whether that's helpful or not. But. We're good, thank you. I appreciate what you had to say. When I saw this on the agenda, um, not that I'm an attorney or can understand any of this, but I found exactly what you just said, is that it's unconstitutional to stop someone's freedom of speech unless it has political leanings. So like the swastika, that would be political. So that would be an easy thing to say no to. Um, any, th any sort of hateful time of things like that are political. So they'd be easy to, it would be easy to say no. Signs and murals, from my understanding of what I've read, are not the same. Signs pertain to guiding someone to a commercial business. Murals are a work of art. So for, let's just say, for example, we took a building, well, we already did, and welcome to Monta Vista. We're not, the artist is not directing anyone to a commercial business. However, if we made a, mon, a, a mural, and I'll use my business as an example, if we wanted to take one of the buildings, let's say the Grand Avenue building that's a mechanic shop now, and that's coming right into Monta Vista. If I wanted to commission an artist to make, make a big mural about, you know, visiting Comshack, that can't, I can't do that because that's directing to them, someone to a commercial business. So that's not necessarily an artistic mural. The artistic murals, and I agree there should be some guidelines, but I think we're making this harder than it needs to be. We don't need to wait three months or even two months. I do believe that by the next meeting, we have a competent enough city staff to put things like, we don't want swastikas, we don't want pot leaves, we don't want you know, whatever it is we don't want. Y'all know what we don't want. It doesn't have to be that hard. This is something that I've been out in the community. I've been listening to people. I've been watching Facebook. I've been talking to people. and You know, we've had some pretty negative stuff in the past month. I don't even want to bring it up. But we've got some people 
getting happy and having some pride in their community, which leads to another economic development question, which is from, from a lot of the economic <laughs> development articles and research that I've done, community is individuals. We use the word community and we lump us all together. But community is actually individual faces. My face, your face, your face, your face. That's our community. Are those faces happy? Do they have pride in their community? Because when we raise community pride, we raise the inevitability that we're going to experience some economic growth. So I really just, I, for my, as, as a voice of one of five, I don't want to see any moratorium at all. I would rather see at our next meeting a list of, of guidelines, you know, and if God can do it in 10, we can do it in 10. There's 10 guidelines. The murals can't be naked, can't be pot leaves, can't be swastikas, can't be insulting, you know, I'm just pulling stuff out of my head here. But we've got something going on great that is it's making people happy. If we want to go after things that are not good, let's go after some of these really ugly signs. And I'm not going to call out the businesses that have them. But there are some really ugly signs. So if we're going to be dealing with something, let's deal with, you know, a different fish. I don't think that the moral, the, the moral, mural is a fish we need to fry right now. It's a good thing. It's a happy thing. It's an uplifting thing. Let's fry some of these things that, some of these fish that are bad. Ugly signs, ugly storefronts. Um, keeping in mind that many business owners are doing the best they can, but let's maybe help them. Find I, I, ways to help. I think, the, I think the murals are a great idea. You know, <clears throat> like, if you think about all the vandalism that's went down and all the spray painting and the gang symbols and signs and everything that's put out in the public view, you know what I mean? And it's like, they're not asking anybody. You know what I mean? They're not asking anybody. They're just doing it. I don't care whose business that is or whose building that is. Just whoosh, go and spray paint on it. You know, and, and that tears apart the city. It makes people think, have a perception towards it. You know, like, <clears throat> even before this first mural went up, I was thinking about murals for the past five years. I mean, I'm like, man, that'd be so awesome. I go through cities and I'm like, check that out. Man, that's pretty cool. Check that out. That's pretty mm -hmm. awesome. You know, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I was talking uh, to Martha today, actually, because she went in and saw the doctor. But um, I'm like, you know... <clears throat> Couldn't there be like, instead of, you know, like the, the, this trying to regulate what people are putting on their buildings or putting out on a mural or, you know, it's like, let's regulate you. I want to know exactly what you're doing. I, mean, I, I just don't like that. You know what I mean? Personally. But uh, like, well, what about some of the businesses in town that have paint that's over five years old or six years old or it's 10 years old or like this building that's been white since I was born? <laughs> I mean like like can there can, can we do something about some of the buildings in town like the one right next to Dairy Queen and say hey can you guys paint your building because like I was telling Martha and forgive me but it looks like a peed mattress <laughs> you know what I mean it's like ugly the color the everything mm -hmm. I'm like how can we can't like like be like Why hey can you some... have something like paint that's five years or newer or or I don't know just Something to make the town look more pretty, more acceptable, beautiful mm -hmm. to the to the eye, you know, because uh, perception is one hundred percent true in the eye of the beholder. You know what I mean? So it might not look like that, but because he thinks that, it's true to him. You know what I mean? So like, I don't, I don't want to regulate people on what they want to put up. You know, of course if. You know, like, I, I honestly don't think somebody's going to be like, oh, let me go put a, a swatska over there, right in the middle of everything, you know. But, hey, maybe there might be, 
But in all honesty, like you look at the people that we have in Monte Vista, and most of them are upright citizens, right? The people that are not are the ones that are spray painting in the alleys and on businesses and and doing stuff like that in the dark. You know what I mean? Um, we have a beautiful town, you know? Like, I think murals will accent that, you know, and make it better, you know, make, make it uh, more pleasant to the eye. You know, so I'm all for the murals and I really don't want to put a regulation on what people can put up because if people are going to put up a nice mural, they're not going to put up something ugly, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Well, in the building that you're talking about in the building that I pulled out of the air as an example, yours is the, the building you're talking about is coming up by Dairy Queen. It's the first building people see when they come in from the highway. The building I was talking about is the first building people see, big big blank building people see when they're coming in from the Alamosa direction. And they're both ugly. They're just both ugly. So not only am I so in favor of these murals and so anti-moratorium of any sort, Yes, I understand the need for some guidelines, some. But I actually had thought about bringing it up to the city as, you know, could we sponsor, could the city sponsor a mural on one of those two buildings? So that as people come in, they see, welcome to Monta Vista. That's not directing them or anywhere, they're already here. It's saying Monta Vista. Like, <clears throat> so, just me personally, like, like I, I used to be one of those people that would go and spray paint on somebody else's property. You know what I mean? When I was a teenager, and I did a lot of bad things, and I shared with everybody when I was campaigning. You know what I mean? But uh, I've turned around. There's been places where I went through town, and I've seen seen murals, and I'm like, hold on, let me go turn around, let me go and check that out. You know what I mean? Like, I want to see that. You know, and, and not always, but say sometimes that turns into, oh, let's might as well get an ice cream. Or, hey, let's stop at the park real quick. You know, just gives the whole town a different feel. So, I'm all for it. <clears throat> well, I guess everybody knows how Victor not feel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say that if a uh, moratorium was in place, it would be very short, 30, 30 days, 60 days maximum. And that if we need to go with policies and procedures to get that done, then it needs to be done promptly. Because I don't want to say it stop. I appreciate Locke's, um, Councilor Locke's comment about the fact that a community is a group of people, which is very true. You'd started that one discussion and about that uh, post you'd sent around, and I liked that. Um, it, I agree that we need a formalized process. I agree that we probably need some guidelines um, this is not a mural a day we are not getting requests every day to do a new mural it might be fun if we did <laughs> but, but realistically we're not I mean what is it one a month one every two weeks maybe um, I don't see that we need to totally stop this in its tracks because of the fact that we are not talking about a huge number here. And there's not a lot of places to put them, but there's a few places. Yeah. That would be awesome. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm all for that we need to formalize a process. I'm all for that we need to put some guidelines in place to keep us in compliance. Um, I think that we can do that while this continues to run because you'll probably only have one or two more across your, you'd probably only have what, one across your desk in the next 30 days? Well, and, and they're expensive. You know, the, these, this artist just doesn't go out and do it from the kindness of his heart. He's trying to make a living as well. <clears throat> and so for the person, you know, so there is an investment in it. And so just not anybody is going to go paint something. Um, you've all seen the residents on First Avenue and the gentleman that has painted his fence. Well, he wants to do more than that and continue something. We haven't seen what it is, but it's lovely. And um, 
There's little flowers. And it's his right fence. Yeah. When I seen it, I was like, it's oh, his that's fence cool. in his yard. And mm -hmm. Let him that's have awesome. it. He's on PNC. We can regulate people to death. I mean, and, and we, can make, we can make our town very unwelcoming, or we can make it very welcoming. And that's to visitors as well as businesses. I kind of think we need to lean toward the welcoming sign. Instead of making things harder for people who want to do good things, let's make it easier for them to do good things. And let's go after the really ugly stuff. Mm -hmm. I've already, well, when I first came on board <clears throat> back in December, I got a hold of the Workforce Center. And I said, come on, you guys. Your signs are really bad and faded. And unless there's a car there, there uh, it looks abandoned. Yeah. And I said, mm -hmm. it's right on the corner where we're going to have a brand new sky-high building. I said, can you please update, change, color your sign? And um, they're working on it. I'm hoping it's done by Stampede, but. And there are some business owners on uh, on Adam Street that have <laughs> horrible <laughs> ones. No, there's it's an office. It's an active office. Wow. They got pretty quiet during COVID, and we're working from home. But it's a state office. Wow. <laughs> so, would Jean, would we be fine to, in your professional opinion? to just roll what we're doing and then work on the plant procedures. Planning and zoning can work on the procedures and we just carry on. I think right now you probably are okay with that. I, um, I think what I'm hearing is and that all this is really laudable too to, to uh, move forward with murals. Um, we will try to gear up pretty fast for something. I'm, I want this to pass First Amendment challenges uh, that are possible. I want everybody to understand that because every time you try to do something good, there's always somebody who wants to come in and challenge that whole thing and uh, with something that might be unacceptable to you. So uh, we will work as quickly as possible in trying to get an acceptable set of uh, guidelines. I assume, are you going to have any type of committee review of these? Uh, Girls before I would, people start I would up. say no. <clears throat> just because that's yeah. like another just, step in the process. Just, you know, I don't just, know. just, just to just be a, the a, voice a, on the other side, though. And I, I, I agree we should allow free speech. But you're complaining now about ugly buildings. And the first mural that somebody doesn't pay money for, that I go out and do, it's not going to be pretty. And you're not going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so we need honest? to... I don't know. There are some buildings. I think I don't think you could hurt them, no matter what you did. <laughs> yeah, but it, you're you're making comments that you see some buildings are ugly. You will think some murals are ugly as well. Well, that's true. I would true. say, gee, we most likely we're not the first ones to deal with this. I'm sure there's a code out there that will pass muster that could be done pretty quickly, absolutely, so that we can move forward with this without a moratorium. But to say, let's just do it and have unfettered access to this, at some point you will be the one and you're complaining, that is the ugliest thing. And that's the first people when they drive in is this <laughs> ugly thing that Jason painted on the side of it. Well, I did say there needed to be some, you know, some guidelines. I, d I did say you know, maybe a checklist of it's got to be this or not be that or, you know, what. so that, yeah, I agree with having some guidelines, but I don't think that it would take so long that a moratorium no, is I, called it's already for. Been done. We're it's not for. the first to deal with this. Right. Right. I'm, I'm sure. Right. And, and you're, you're right. There, there are pieces of art that other people just love, and I look at them and go, Ew. however, it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. It matters whether the citizens of this town have pride in their town. That's what matters. That's what it comes down to. I'm a car guy. You know what I mean? So like when I see other cars, I'm like, ooh, check that out. Uh-huh. Ooh, check it out. And there's cars that I don't like, and I'm like, whatever. Yeah, but, cool, man. Like that's that's uh -huh. all good because that's them, you know? And I, I appreciate it all regardless. 
June, you had something? Yes, sir. Uh, I will go ahead and send the council the same thing that I sent the planning commission, and I think you'll be able to see what the framework is in there, so we can develop something fairly quickly. I think it'll pass muster. Awesome. Awesome. I know that our current sign ordinance requires, uh, I believe, the city manager to review the sign. I think that having a review, I don't think it needs to be a committee, but I think that it should be reviewed um, before it hits that, before it hits the wall. Yeah, I don't think we need another committee. Uh, we have 20 pages of, of regular, sign ordinance. Of sign but ordinance. those are signs. Yes, but I would still. Which we determined are not yours. But still, it's. It's cumbersome. <laughs> it is, and I agree the sign ordinance needs to be simplified by a page. I mean, down to a page. But signs and murals are not the same thing. So the sign ordinance oh, wouldn't, we need for wouldn't pertain to the murals yeah, anyway. We, don't need we just need to. There, there is a blending sometimes. Uh, all this is not black and white, unfortunately between signs and murals just because you can have a mural that is directing people towards something in, in a subtle way and still be a mural. Well, Tell but that's a sign. They need to come up with something in a simple welcome to Monta Vista well, is not a sign. Because no, like I said, it's not directing them anywhere. No, that, that's see it, they're all here. I'm just saying that there are some blends in here that you'd be hard for us to say, is this a sign or is this a mural? And one of the one of the signs we got, uh, I think it's still there in the post office. That mural. Oh yeah, yeah the wall. Oh, and mm -hmm. and it, it depicts actual characters wasn't in Monta Vista. Isn't that you can Homer Wright? Who that is? It wasn't it Homer Wright? It isn't it Homer Wright? Yeah, is that his Homer? name? Yeah. yeah, in the post office. So, Mr. Mayor, you will need to have a motion whether to approve or deny the recommendation from Planning and Zoning. Temporary. Let's go ahead. <clears throat> I would move that we do not have a moratorium on murals, but that we do come up very quickly within a 30 day period of guidelines for murals in Monta Vista. Second it. I have a motion and a second to. Um, not have a temporary moratorium on murals, but come up with guidelines for that. Is there any more discussion? Unita? Councilor Foster? Aye. Councilor Locke? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sibella? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to deny the recommendation of the planning and zoning to place a moratorium on murals and to have a 30-day turnaround period for some sort of mural standards. Thank you. Resolutions. Rob, 2022-07, establishing water restrictions. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. In your packets, you have a few documents. Um, I did put, because some of the council may not be aware, but um, quite a few years ago, we did a document to start looking at some of the drought conditions. And we put in a, um, some triggers, triggering criteria for water restrictions. I won't read them all, but it kind of lists um, the different levels. Um, we have enacted in years past a level one um, mild drought conditions within the city. Um, to be perfectly honest, with current conditions the way they are, we could probably look at doing something a little more stringent, like a level two. Um, but for tonight, just to establish some watering restrictions in town, I did just simply continue from 2021 and ask council to, to enact um, level one mild drought condition um, restrictions within the city limits, which limits um, residences to water um, with even number addresses on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, odd numbered addresses, um, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and watering on Sunday for everyone. So um, there's a resolution, a resolution 2022-07 um, that says that um, council will be enacting 
level one watering restrictions um, and it just basically re redoes the resolution 07 2021 and it continues it into 2022 so i'll um, open it up for any discussion at this point from what date to what date uh, it would be from june 2nd tonight through october 16th 2022 from now until October 16th. I would move to approve resolution 2022-07, uh, resolution establishing watering restrictions. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve resolution 2022-07 for water restrictions for the city of Monta Vista. Is there any more discussion? Are people still able to submit an uh, application for like gardening and new grass? Yes. So the exemption still holds in a, in a level one drought. Yes. Anita? Councilor Foster? Aye. Councilor Luck? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sibilla? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve resolution 2022-07. Establishing watering restrictions on sprinkler systems and lawn irrigation. Thank you. And this will go out on city page and will it be mailed out to on the we can put it on the water bills as well. Yeah. It's okay. That's on the one going out tonight. Okay. Sorry, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Okay, city attorney contract. If all, excuse me, council all has the, the contract in front of you. It outlines our expectations of the city attorney. I'm going to first welcome Mr. Farish to being the city attorney and, and um, as we move forward. So it states that he needs to attend meetings, provide legal advice, he'll do phone consultations, He'll monitor legislation. He'll supervise any outside legal services. Um, so kind of highlights, it's a two-year contract and it is at a flat salary of 40,000 per year. Now, I was alerted yesterday that Mr. Farish possibly would like it, that increased. There hasn't been an increase on this contract for the last six or seven years, so I understand it. And his recommendation was 48,000 a year. So I think that if there's any direct questions about the contract, we need to ask Mr. Farish and not let me be the middleman. <laughs> what uh, made you choose 8,000? It was my understanding, um, Councillor, that um, the present salary was 4000 a month, and I guess that wasn't the case. Um, so I said that I would do it for the same amount. Um, <clears throat> I see a, a lot of work <laughs> that we've got to do, frankly, uh, and uh, it's going to require uh, myself, and of course I'm going to be helped by Seth uh, getting all this done. I'm sorry, I can't um, hear you. I couldn't hear that last Oh, I'm time. sorry. I, I said it's going to require a lot of work, and I will be helped by Seth, uh, who's in my office and president here at the same time. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do the job regardless of what you said it at, of course. So uh, I, I would ask that you consider that amount, uh, and I think it's probably fair. Well, I just calculated it out. It comes out to six hundred sixty-six dollars a month and sixty-six cents. That's a little yeah. spooky to me, but that's that's for, beside the point. Forty-eight thousand, not eight thousand. 
As far as the difference. Oh, I'm sorry, the difference, okay. Yes, the the, the difference. Um, I'm sorry. In the attorney world, that's not a whole lot of money. No. (laughs) I mean, it's not not make or break you money. Um, However, 8,000 to the city, there's some other projects we could do with that. I'm not saying no, I'm just, Arguing with you. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, because <laughs> we're, we're talking about eight thousand um, dollars. Now, other people on this on this board have have seen your work. I haven't. I haven't. So I have a hard time being in favor of a raise when I haven't seen what you're capable of yet. Does that, does that make sense? And I don't mean that to be insulting. I know that you're a perfectly capable attorney or you wouldn't be as successful as you are. However, I haven't seen $8,000 <clears throat> worth of extra good. Is there um, somehow that we can uh, do like a review in the short time. You like, know, there's an idea. You know, I'm at your mercy on all this. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> I think do it every day. I'm kind of like that too, because it's public information. So sure, it, if it was mistaken by not looking, but that'd be like me hiring somebody today and then starting tomorrow and telling me, oh, by the way, I want this or I'm not going to do this or I want this or. It's like, wait a minute. Okay, well, different, totally different. Because I don't deny that you can't do that, but I feel like, um, one, it's like that proving point, right? You, and some of us have seen your work, and we no qualms about that at all. But let's take a little step into this. So do a review. Add to that. Because we still, as we said and talked about budget, we still have to be concerned with that hit and budget when we weren't planning on it. If I'm correct. And then my only other question to that is when you called you need and ask her, Tor was telling her about that instead of calling Gigi or us. That would be my only concern, G. So my opinion is one of five. We need to work toward it, not just do it up front. I like Victor's idea of a, of a review at a certain point. I suppose we need to set, decide what that point is. Well, six months would be December, and that's about the end of the year when we do evaluations. Probably need to do it before then, though, we budget for next year. Yeah, oh, we start in October. Yeah, so we have to do it. We'd have to do it before October. I have 90 days. Three <laughs> 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 months. on. <laughs> So is everybody and then okay you with give us feedback then what sure. time can, yeah what time it's taken so far <clears throat> September yeah. second so meeting in September <coughs> yeah we can do the evaluation then we can evaluate through there because we know there's a lot to do yeah you yourself have, so it oh, needs to be done. So I'll well, probably need to be a work session to yeah. discuss it beforehand. Yeah, right. it's been the second meeting. So we'll plan a work session in September. Um, so we'd like for you to sign the contract tonight. Whatever your decision is, sign the contract. Yes. I'll make a motion to approve the contract as written with a review to come in September. Seconded. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the contract as written. And we have an evaluation in September. Is there any more discussion? You need a Councilor Foster? Aye. Councilor Locke? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Segola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion to two the city attorney's contract as written with a review in September. All right.
staff proposals, reports, and actions. City Clerk, Anita. Huh? She's not on there. Her name would be real big right there, there and highlight because <laughs> I've already. <laughs> I've uh, talked about the that. financials and <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, he's split like 14 <laughs> times to make sure her name's not here. Good evening, um, Mayor and Council. Um, just a few things I wanted to go over with you this evening. Um, we're extremely busy in the clerk's office. Um, we have re liquor license renewals coming our way. Um, business license and then a lot of vendors permits with all the events that are coming up throughout the summer. Um, I know she's not here tonight, she's on vacation, but I really want to give a huge thank you to Lorna. Um, she is my assistant and she's doing an absolutely amazing job and she is always willing to help out with other departments as they ask. So I just wanted you all to know that she's doing a great job and I thank her very much for that. Um, municipal Court has been busy. Um, we have a lot of um, useful public service hours that have been brought in in the last couple weeks. So it, that's really nice to see that the defendants who come in and who get the useful public service are actually doing it. And we're able to verify that that work has been done. Um, we have some, some of the kids who are doing some useful public service out at Sky High. So it's good to see that they're they're doing what they're told that they need to be do doing to clear their court case. Uh, Planning and Zoning Commission um, is working on short-term rentals and the sign code and the mural code. <coughs> um, they will have a work session on June the 20th. Um, other news for the city is I would like to remind everybody in the city that you need to register your dog. Um, last year we had 228 dogs registered by this time of the year. This year I have 48. So we just put out a press release um, about registering your dog and also keeping them safe. So hopefully people will start coming in and getting their dogs registered. Um, there are penalties and you can be fined for not having your dogs licensed within the city limits. The first penalty is a $25 charge, second penalty is $50, and the third is $100. Um, so I'd just like to encourage the citizens to please come in and get your dogs licensed. Um, it also helps that if your dog gets out of the yard and runs away, we can help you locate that dog, or if that dog gets picked up, they can call and say, hey, this is the tag number, and we can call the owner to find the animal's home. Um, I also want to remind the citizens that all businesses must be licensed. That includes home-based businesses as well. Um, you can get the application online at the City of Monta Vista's website. You can also contact our office at any time for that application. Um, but all businesses have to be licensed within the City of Monta Vista. So I'm trying really hard to get all five of your commitments to this next project. CML is offering on June 8th and June 15th a one hour class from 12 to one. That class is going over resilient leadership. Um, Colorado has recently experienced more intense and frequent disasters. This trends to exp expedite to continue in our communities and we are not fully prepared. This class will help you prepare and help discuss on how communities can plan and recover from disasters. So I Where is this at? So it's online. So it's um, June 8th and June 15th from 12 to 1. It is just an online webinar. Um, if you all are interested, I will register you and send you the link. So it's June 8th or June 15th? No, Both there's two classes. Two, two classes? Two classes? Huh? Okay. So June 8th and June 15th, and it's a one-hour webinar. You can register me, and if I have something else, another commitment, either of those days, I'll change that. Okay. It's through the lunch hour. I could probably have 8th and 15th. Okay. Please. You can put me I down, too. 
Because uh, <clears throat> what it says here in this, what you just read, there's nothing that can prepare you for a disaster. Right. <clears throat> no, but if other communities, if we all work together and feed off of each other, we can hopefully devise a better solution to help the victims of fires to better recover. We can be prepared for the tangible and pragmatic, but we, you're right, there's no way to prepare for the emotional. There, there just isn't. Okay. Yeah. So if I may follow up with Nita, do you guys get those emails or do you pay any attention to them or do we need to bring them up and remind you? The online webinar? The CML? Yeah. The yeah. CML? I, I see them, I just really don't do it all the time. I, I don't think I got this ways. one. I don't think yeah. that I got that. I do get some CML stuff from time to time. Um, I get a lot more from that next move group that I don't know who they are. But um, okay. anyway, I, I, okay. I don't know that I'm getting them all. I do know that I am getting some. Okay, so we will bring them up to your attention. Okay. And, and we, we, the city, is the sponsor of the fall meeting for our district, and that's in September. Am I still so, in charge of entertainment? What time? No. <laughs> You're in charge no, of entertainment. No, in charge of entertainment. You put me in charge of no, entertainment. I did not. You, you volunteered. Bring your banjo. <laughs> I got puppets. So, and that's <laughs> September, right? September 20th, and um, I actually been working on that this week. Um, I think Gigi and I have a pretty good game plan together. September 20th. And that'll be submitted to CML before the end of June. Um, so, but... I, I just would, I think that that CML webinar would be a benefit to council. I will not do that. Okay. You got do I have all of your commitments? I'm unavailable on the first one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll play in the That one can't change. I'll be, I'll be here. A um, couple other things. On June 4th at Faith Hinckley Memorial Park, you all have been invited to a military send-off at 11 a.m. There are two recruits. June 4th? June 4th. Yeah, this Saturday. Yeah. At 11? At 11. June 9th at 10.30, 10.35, at 9th and Tyndall Street. You're all invited to the CRHDC ribbon cutting ceremony to celebrate the opening of the Tierra del Sol Estates Phase 2. And then one last date. Um, CML Annual Conference is June 21st to the 24th. Uh, Victor is the only one signed up to go to that right now. Um, if you are interested, I have until the 10th to sign you up to go to that CML Conference. That's in Breckenridge, right? That is in Breckenridge. And I'm, I'm going. I'll be there with Victor as well. Cool. And so will I. And so will Gene. You going, Jason? No. <laughs> no, it's like, I know what happens right now. Okay. Do the CML, do they video any of their stuff that maybe sometimes, the, so those of us that can't make it can watch it later? No. No? I, I don't know. Okay. They, I don't think they video, but they do give you the materials, the written materials and the outlines and the slides. You can access those, and if you have any trouble doing that, we access them for you. Okay. That's helpful. I appreciate that. So if you have no questions, that's it. Thank you, Yanita. Thank you. Public Works, Mr. Reynolds. One more time. Good job. So I gave you a written report to kind of go through it real quick. Um, so, um, 
Summer's here, and unfortunately, we really aren't ready for it. So we've experienced several issues with our parks. We're working diligently to try to get those done and fixed. A lot of our lines are broken, and we're finding that a lot of our solenoids and stuff aren't working, so sprinklers aren't coming on when they're supposed to. So we've got a lot of brown spots showing out there. We're replacing as many as we can. Unfortunately, time is hitting us as well. A lot of our solenoids are so old they can't find them. So we're having to replace the entire valve assembly. Um, it's gotten so bad that we've actually um, contracted with um, Holman Irrigation to come in and give us some professional assistance to try to get things up and moving again. So um, we'll be seeing that. They, they've been doing a few of the parks. Um, I think today we finally got Chapman Park up and running, so it's going. We've replaced approximately 160 foot of pipe that had broke and collapsed. Um, so we think we have that one running now. And the utilities, um, we're almost back up to fully staffed. On April, we took a pretty huge hit to our wastewater division. Um, we have three employees, one of which is the supervisor there, and we lost two of them. So um, we were fortunate that Danny, who worked over at Sky High, was able to move over and he's now with our wastewater folks. Um, um, Andrew Valenzuela, one of our long-term 30-year employees, stepped up and he moved over to the plant to kind of help us out in the interim until we get everybody trained. So I'd like to give a huge shout out to him and, and all the help that he's been doing for us. Um, we've had a few leaks coming out of the winter. Um, just really curb stops that are leaking, so the guys have been digging a few curb stops. Um, we did put in a budget uh, to purchase a new mini excavator and a compact roller. Um, for the last two weeks, we've had the mini excavator in town, and we've been doing some work. We've been out at the ballparks, um, Chapman Park. We've done two curb stops with it, just letting the guys kind of see what size, if that's really the machine they want, if we need a bigger one, so. And working to try to get a, a compact roller down here too to help us out with some of our patches and blade patches and stuff. Um, the the SEP is, I, in, in the report I said there wasn't any movement. We did get an email today. So we're back on negotiations and working on that. I don't know, maybe Gigi and her report might go a little more, but there's really not a whole lot to report on that. Um, we did start spraying mosquitoes on May 12th, and it's moving along fairly well. Um, we still have a few citizens that are coming in one or two a week, um, asking not to, to be placed on the do not spray list, so that list is steadily growing. Is that a <coughs> little piece of paper? Yeah, there's there these little signs that say do not spray. Yeah, I've seen um, those walk so, like, yeah, yeah, that was part of our educational thing that we talked about to try to help the citizens and to make sure our drivers when they're out at eight o'clock to one o'clock in the morning be able to see hey I'm coming up to a house that doesn't want to spread so we can turn it off um, just to try to do a better service to our citizens so we've got those out um, we're like I said weekly we're adding at least one so far every week um, this week was three so we're adding to that list pretty much every week so might be something that council one time might need to consider right now. I think we're fine just doing what we're doing. It seems to be working. Um, with the new hires, um, we're training a brand new series of guys doing the spraying, so the signs are helping with that. So, um, We are already starting to work towards Stampede. Um, we're a little behind. Um, I had a crew meeting today and Instead of kind of waiting until the end, we're, we've kind of assigned that anytime anybody throughout the entire public works crew has any downtime that they're supposed to start working on some of the stampede stuff, cleaning up weeds, doing some stuff for, so we're not right, you know, two weeks before the event, just rushing and trying to get everything done. So, so trying to do a little more proactive with that. Um, you were briefed last meeting on the multimodal grant from CDOT. Um, we are still waiting on the paperwork so we can start design, but that was a 
or one point eight million dollar award, um, and that'll do some really good things to see a completion of what CDOT's currently doing in our town. So all those new curb ramps that they're putting in, we'll be able to add sidewalks and curb and gutter to that too. So that'll be a huge, huge deal for us. Um, Highway 160 project is moving nicely. They're looking at the week of June 13th through the 15th to close the highway to um, do the railroad <coughs> crossing replacement. So that's been moved to June 13th through the 15th. 160 will be closed and they will do a detour route using 6th Avenue on that. So 6th Avenue back over to 15 and then back up. Okay, so hopefully it shouldn't last more than three days. Um, other good news that's not in my report. Um, Cooley um, came in last week, last Friday, and they started doing the property cleanups. Um, they're continuing all week this week, and they've got the large majority of the three properties that were completely damaged um, from the fire. The large majority of that property, those three properties have been cleaned up. Um, if you drive by there, you'll see a considerable change from what it was after the fire. So we are moving forward, and I would like to thank Gigi and Council for your guys' support to let us do that cleanup because that's really not a city's obligation to do. But I think in you know, just listening to Council's discussion tonight, it just goes to show that you guys want us to continue to move forward. So I thank you for that. It is a cost, but I do I, I do appreciate it. I think it will help our community heal and move forward. So and with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Sixth uh, Avenue, um, the road is pretty beat up. The road is very beat up. <clears throat> um, any plans that the who, who, who's working on that? The county, or no? So right now we have a contractor. Uh, Excel is in, and they're replacing the gas main and the fiber optic line that runs along Sixth Avenue. So the fiber optic is, went in first, and then they came behind it, and they put the gas line in, a new gas main, and now they're in the process of digging out all of that flow fill and starting to patch it back. So I'm uh, just kind of curious, are they going to, like... It will be patched. It won't... They will not completely fix that street. It's still really rough, and it's going to be rough until we find the money <coughs> to, redo to the whole whole replace road. that thing. But it, it has... A main trunk line on it it also has water main on it so it is a fairly detailed project yeah it's just several million dollars to do that entire section of right because it's a whole mile yes. yes um i was just thinking because that road is so okay. trash i avoid it i root i i dented two of my rims i'm like oh man really yeah so i'm out there with the hammer <laughs> terrible so anyways i was just curious like yeah no it's 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 still pretty bad but um excel needed to do that uh, those upgrades on the line they, those lines were really old so to, just to make sure we had good service cool just wanted to know what's happening yeah well and if i can interrupt i was trying to find it real quick in in the audit you know we in the past there has not been very much money put into the road maintenance. It all went to, okay, let's try and save potholes and snow removal. And so that little portion of the one cent is what gets us about 150,000 a year. Yeah, well, a little more, about 193,000. It's like a block. Yeah. Not even. Yeah, so. <laughs> Not like even. A quarter of a so yeah, the two things that um, this council has done <coughs> is you've increased our paving budget which is in fund 84 if you ever want to look in the the, the budget fund 84 it used to be fifty thousand um, dollars 25 of that went to patch and the other 25,000 went to sand for the winter um, you've increased that from 50 to a hundred thousand and then when the citizens have voted in the one cent sales tax that produces Roughly 190, 193,000 this last year, which was what budgeted. 
So we are moving up. We have approximately $200,000 from 50, so a huge increase um, to work towards paving projects. And you have to remember that includes crack sealing and chip sealing and actual pavement. Um, and then, you know, it doesn't make any sense for us to pave a street if the water and the sewer is still old and, and decrepit. I, I will guarantee you from experience that if we spend the money to overlay a street or tear out the asphalt and put new asphalt down without doing the work underground that nobody sees, that within that first year you will cut that asphalt at least twice and ruin what you just spent uh, lots and lots of money on. So, um, so we are moving there. Another question, just sorry. Um, the tennis court, I remember we were doing like a ceiling or something on a tennis that court. That got sealed, some of it. There were some cracks that developed through the winter after that was sealed. So there's some additional cracks that are on there. So just curious. So the, the tennis courts is one that we need to try to find a grant to redo the, whole the complete. Well, the base needs to be redone because that's where those cracks are coming from. The freeze thaw cycles that we go through. So. Well, that was brought to my attention to what I, I'll let you know on is it Pioneer Street where it goes into that alley, drops off the pavement. Yes. Pioneer. That's um, Corlette back here. Yes. There is, it looks like phone lines down. They go okay. across the road. They're in the Colette Street, the dirt park. Uh -huh. They go across the road and through somebody's driveway. Okay. And that person said it's his mom's place. He said, I called several people. It acts like nobody cares. And I said, well, it's probably a phone line and nobody has home phones anymore. I do that. So, That's what okay. it looks like laying across there. But it's completely across the road and through the alley. I will go check that out and we will get somebody on that next week. So it's either cable or phone. Yeah, it looked like phone to me, but okay. Okay. So I, w I have I have some local contacts for a century link so I can get a hold of them. Well I figured if it was t cable, somebody'd be complaining about it because I'm sure that cord's been run over <laughs> now. Well sometimes they just run those temporary across the ground like that and that might be something they've done and they haven't picked it up. It, so. it looked like there was a hook on one end, so like maybe the wind had popped it, popped it off. Popped okay. Part of part of the poles. Okay. I will take care of that. Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. Any others? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. IT. No, police department. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, sit down, IT. You're giving your report. <laughs> so, Chief Pankfelder actually did do a report and it's in front of all of you. It's yeah. written here, but you can come read it. Well, so, no, well Sergeant <laughs> Eugene was going was in here and said he was going to present Where's, the report. Oh. Sergeant, did he get called um, away? The schedule had slight modifications. Oh. <laughs> So Mr. Pino, why don't you go ahead and... The notes in the back are mine, not Chief's, so okay. please don't, don't go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, good evening, Council. Um, I'll just go bullet for bullet. Not too sure. I, I'm still a patrol officer. <laughs> Nothing high up yet. Yeah. Um, officer Brandon Sanchez graduated from the Academy and became a certified officer. He's now in phase one of <coughs> FTO. He is currently with... He's now in phase two, actually. He's with Corporal Harper. Uh, we hired two additional officers, a Brittany Martinez. Brittany comes from the Alamosa County Sheriff's Office. Uh, she has worked there for the past four years. Um, officer Daniel Golden. Daniel just graduated from the Police Academy. Uh, both Brittany and Daniel are com completing their administrative week and will start FTO next week. Uh, FTO is a field training. Uh, it is a 16-week program where the where the new officers work with the trainer and must meet, and must meet expectations and pass phases in order to become a fully certified officer. Uh, the detective process is complete and the appointment will be announced next week. Uh, 
we have started working with started working on operation plans for Sky High. Uh, June 6th, the Mount Vista Police Department will host a first responder after action review of the Mount Vista fire. This is for responding agencies and entities to discuss the response to identify strengths and weaknesses. At the June 16th meeting, we will do ceremony, ceremonial swearing in for new officers, uh, Ann Robinson, Brendan Sanchez, Brittany Martinez, and Daniel Golden. Uh, Chief is currently attending a crime victim advisory board meeting in Denver all day, uh, which is why he is unable to be at this meeting today. Uh, very bottom it says go abs. I don't want to find out he's at a hockey game right now. Maybe the point on that avalanche is this is June. What's going on with that? Maybe. That'll be the non sports person here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Thank, thank you very much. Thank no you, officer. Thanks for being put on the spot. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you for shining. <laughs> You did very well. You, you know, I'm, I'm here to help you, my friend. <laughs> school's, school's paying off. <laughs> <laughs> now the IT. It's going down. <laughs> Look at him sitting back there like, dude, I don't have to do this. <laughs> yeah. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Where's his peanut club? In typical IT fashion, we don't have very much to report. It's going to be quick and sweet. But we have new AT&T access points put up throughout the building. That's providing better cell signal throughout the building. And that came to us from at and at no cost. For our privileged accounts, so the admin accounts that me, Christian, and just you run the city to install software, now have two-factor two -factor authentication on them, which just better security makes it so that we're not as vulnerable as we were previously. We have completed our computer inventory, so every device that we've had throughout the city has been verified and has been verified that it's still here or it's been disposed of. We have audited our Active Directory, which is for our security. It allows us to get rid of old accounts, which is a security risk as if there's an old account that had access to something, say something with the finance or something with the city manager, that just allows us to minimize any risk there. We have completed our lock audit, which is just getting rid of old accounts that had access to the locks here. So anyone that had a key card, a key fob or something that didn't was no longer working here, but was still active, has been taken out now. And then we have repurposed old computers to extend the PD's workforce. And those computers were repurposed at no cost to the city. And we're just continuing our updating on the systems to keep up on security. Any questions? You guys do a great job. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question. Have... I'm sorry, go ahead. I have a question, but somebody else is on. <laughs> I've heard, and, and I've experienced this too, sometimes it's hard, especially when the room is full. I know it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. It will happen more often in the future. Um, people have, hard, have a hard time hearing us. I had a hard time hearing Mr. Farish just a little while ago. Sometimes I have a hard time hearing our city manager or Nita. I know that these microphones feed into the recording device for legal purposes, I get that. Can, do they have the capability to enhance our voices as well so the audience can hear us better? I'm not sure if our current system does have that capability. I know we can play them through the speakers here. However, that can cause a feedback loop, which can cause- Right, we don't want to do that. Yes. So well, here he comes. Really hard enough. Talk yeah. into it now. <laughs> so these are connected directly to these speakers behind you guys. The issue we run into, especially with how sound travels across this room, if we start to crank it up, it feeds back almost instantaneously. So we pretty much killed it purely to help out the recording so that way we can at least hear what you guys are saying. Ultimately, what we need to do is completely revamp what we do have, and that ultimately just requires time and money. So it's in the works, just not something that we have immediately. Right. Well, I know but, that when I watch our YouTube videos, I mean, I can hear it if I turn my phone up. Right, but right. So for when I'm talking, time, I'm, look how far I am from the mic on the camera. Right. So, so gonna, the mic on the camera is actually shut off for the exact same reason. Do you, were you watching videos, I'd say a couple months ago, maybe even half a year ago? 
Do you hear like this hissing sound in the back? A little bit. It has gotten so better. So that is purely because of all the different systems that are tied together. We are just minimizing as many things as possible to try to remove that. It boils down to feedback from the speakers and the cables that are underneath your desk. They are not the greatest. So it, it's one of those we need something a little more unified that's meant for that specific purpose as these speakers up here are a portable system that you usually set up for like concerts or events. They're not meant for a council room. The other big thing is uh, there's no sound ending in this room. It, the sound quality is better when this room is full. So mm -hmm. if there's any other good reason to fill up this place, that is another thing that can be added to the list. But it's just, we, we're pushing what we do have here to its limits and there's not a whole lot else I can dial in because I've, I've messed with this. I've been very nervous about sound quality being terrible. And by this point, I think we've got it about as good as we're going to get it with what we've got. Okay. Well, thank you. That at least answers my question that yeah, little, little time and I, little I money can fix anything. I that DOS would probably not know as he hasn't had to fight a lot of the issues with this. Right. That being said, uh, with, with how things are going, with how we're set up, he's probably going to be getting more of the reports. A, because I can get out of them, and B, because I'm not always <laughs> going to be here. That and uh, let's be honest, it was his first time, and he did better than I normally do. He did great? Yeah, he did so. And I appreciate you stepping in and answering. Oh, of course. I, I don't like being put on the spotlight, and I'm sure that's one of those situations where you don't know the answer to the question at all, and you kind of ask, kind of like uh, what Pino just went through. That's honestly a question I've been meaning to ask for months and just kept forgetting. I've been Tonight, I wrote it. it down, so I remember. I honestly have been waiting for it because uh, this is probably something. There are a lot of things within IT that if something were to happen, no one's really going to see it. We can fix problems. We can go through and you know fix our own mistakes as we move forward without really it interfering with anyone else. This right here is public facing, and it's you know right in front or right behind of you guys. So if anything goes wrong, not only do you guys see it, but everyone else sees it on YouTube. So this is one of those things that uh, I've been most worried about in regards to this position, honestly. But well, I know it. I, I know the equipment exists that it, that it can be done, but it's not free. Oh yeah, the uh, and that's it exactly. <laughs> it's just they, not free. The moment you start to mention this type of situation when it comes to audio, they seem to just start increasing the price just because they can, because there's not much else. The other big thing is we're not audio engineers. Like I, I know a little bit. I know the basics, but this is definitely not something I'm super knowledgeable in. So when it comes to this, I, we're, we're learning as we move forward, but I'm not 100% certain or what's the word? I'm not sure what to look for as we design systems like this right here. Okay. Give me, give me but, a call when you're ready to do it. Okay. Well, I mean, you guys will probably know because I'll be excited when the time comes. I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we will hear you without a microphone, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you will. So Good. these microphones were initially set up purely for you guys to uh, have a recording. You right. Know, especially for legality purposes, the camera was kind of just added on as a, a bonus. That way people who couldn't make it here tonight would be able to watch it afterwards. And the, the big problem to this is we've just been like piling new things on top of old and it doesn't really clash super well. We tried to bring this in so that we'd have sound for you need as can or for a computer. That being said, it causes big problems with the microphones. We tried to integrate those and I'm sure you remember those issues or maybe it was before you guys actually joined council. But I know Dale will remember us having some feedback issues during meetings and us constantly having to run back and forth and adjust it. So it's just, it's one of those headachey issues that IT has. That being said, and it's I've an issue here, that money will fix. Money, so, time, experience. Sure. I mean, so right. like Councilwoman Lock, it, it's one of the, we do have bids um, mm -hmm. for oh, improvements good. in the council chambers as well as for the conference room, and um, and that we were will want to be <coughs> visiting with you all in regards to how we spend some of our American Rescue funds. So some of our what? America Rescue funds. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. I'm sorry. 
for <laughs> protocol there. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Of course. Sorry this one went on, you know, quite a few minutes longer than normal. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You guys did a good Thank job. You, Thank you. Mr. Farish? Mayor and members of the council, good to be home. Um, I first want to thank the council for the appointment here. <clears throat> this was uh, pretty emotional, uh, really, uh, for us. I went home and told Evelyn about this, and she said, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, it really happened. Uh, and. Uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty overwhelming uh, to be back and to uh, be sitting in that chair again after five and a half years. Uh, <clears throat> in that regard, I do want to say that I intend to be the attorney for the entire council, all of you. And uh, the city attorney is the city's attorney through the elected members who are you. So you are the one who calls the shots of what projects we're going to do and be involved with. And this council speaks with one voice when it makes a decision. And that is the decision of the council. And the other councilors are bound to support that decision regardless of whether they voted for that way or, or whether they didn't. So uh, that's something I learned from Ferris Burbank uh, years and years ago. Um, and uh, so, uh, one of the reasons that I took this job was I think this is one of the best opportunities I have seen for this city to really go in years. Uh, I don't know of any other city in the state of Colorado that has a city manager who's been Secretary of State, State Senator, County Administrator, uh, served on too many numerous committees to even mention probably uh, state committees, a uh, police chief who has been a major in state patrol, has had numerous uh, uh, people under him, um, a uh, city clerk who's experienced, uh, a uh, public works director uh, who knows the infrastructure of the city uh, very, very well. And um, it's really an honor to be able to serve with all these people and uh, really bring everybody, help bring everybody together into one focus. And, Probably the, the words that you're going to hear from me a lot are uh, vision and focus about what we're going to try to get done. Um, and I just am uh, happy to be part of that. Uh, since my appointment, uh, well over a month ago, I've sat down with uh, Gigi uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, George. Um, I had a session in municipal court uh, that I attended and sat down with Judge Zollers there. Uh, I've sat down with Anita several times um, and uh, just chatting about what your thoughts are about uh, what to do. And I think what I picked up uh, is it's not a question of what to do, it's, it's a question of what to do first. So um, there are a lot of things in the mill right now. I will be going to CML meeting incidentally uh, also and picking up more information there. But <clears throat> absent any other directions from the council, here are some of the priorities that I see that I intend to work on. Um, first of all, Anita's mentioned several times, I 
watched the, the videos of most of the council meetings up to about uh, eight or nine months ago when I got too busy after that. Uh, but uh, she mentioned several times uh, charter revision. Our charter is exactly 100 years old. Uh, it was enacted in March, March the 28th of, of uh, 1922, and it's one of the oldest charters in the state. We've got uh, a number of things in there that you should be aware of that are really outmoded and outdated. Um, Section 73, for example, says that uh, it requires a vote of the people to assign a franchise. Section 88, uh, the Charities Commission. I don't think that that has operated for years. Uh, Section 90, Monta Vista Day, when uh, we're supposed to close businesses for a half a day. I don't think I've seen that working either. Uh, Section 68 health officer. I don't think we have a health officer appointed. Um, the uh, Article 3 of the Charter, for example, recall. Do we really want the city clerk, the city treasurer, the police chief, and the city manager subject to recall by the people? Because those are appointed officers. I don't know whether you knew all those things were in there, but uh, that's <coughs> representative of some of the things in our charter. Uh, there are other things that maybe we need to take a look at, which is the way that uh, you have to pass ordinances with two readings. In statutory towns, for example, that is not a requirement. Uh, you can just have passage at the same time as a reading. And the only reason I mention that is that the length of time it takes you to really enact an ordinance is something that we may want to take a look at on charter revision. Um, there are uh, other things about uh, the annual appropriations ordinance and budget required to be submitted before the first day of October, but allows the council to fix the date, uh, and section 54 requires passage of the ordinance between October 1st and November the 1st. In comparison, the state statute 29-1-108 requires the appropriations for the budget to be simply made by uh, December the 31st and be submitted by the city manager by October the 15th. Um, so <clears throat> these are things that uh, we may want to take a look at and uh, I would uh, glad to be part of and even uh, head that uh, charter revision process if you want me to do that. Um, we, if, if you decide that that's the route that you want to go, we, start, we should start thinking about a charter review committee um, and that will probably morph into a charter revision, uh, formal charter revision committee. Um, so uh, that's going to take some time. Uh, it would have to go to a public vote. But that's something to really, it's, it's kind of um, house cleaning in a way, but it uh, has a lot of things in there about how you really operate, what you're supposed to be doing. Your charter in a home rule city is your governing document. It is your constitution, as it were. Uh, and everything has to be in conformance with that. There's some fairly complicated rules about how that relates to state statutes and when uh, the city is preempted, when it's not, when it can legislate side by side with state statutes and so forth. And that's another discussion to have. But uh, I think this is something that we probably ought to start working on. Another thing, a more immediate thing, uh, and I've uh, talked to the city manager about this, uh, the uh, 2020 version of the MTC. Um, model traffic code is a code adopted by the city in which the provisions for governing traffic 
are lifted out of Title 42 that a city can legislate on and put into a model traffic code. So there are, you got to know the rules in those things because there are things that you can legislate on that go all the way up to 12 point violations, uh, like eluding a police officer, uh, eight point violations like reckless driving, and so forth. Whereas other 12 point violations and even eight point violations regarding uh, alcohol related offenses, uh, driving under the influence, driving while ability impaired, you cannot legislate on. So, um, about once every 10 years, CDOT comes out with a new version of the model traffic code, and the last one was the 2020 version. Uh, you're still on the 2010 version right now. Um, so, I've talked to uh, city manager about this, I've talked to uh, the police chief about this, and they're both in agreement that uh, we need to get this done as soon as possible and bring in the new version. So <clears throat> that's something that uh, I would intend to be working on. Um, another thing you may want to look at is your municipal court jurisdiction level. Uh, you're at still $1,000 and 90 days in jail, I think. And you have jurisdiction all the way up to $2,650 in one year. Now, not that you're going to have people incarcerated or have fines done, but there are some situations that the city could get into that you may uh, want to say, well, we've only got jurisdiction to do it up this far. So I don't think it's going to really make much difference as far as the sentencings go. Uh, in municipal court, but it does improve your uh, your jurisdiction uh, of what you have. So that's something that you may want to consider too. Um, the planning commission. I went to the planning commission meeting last Thursday, uh, and there are a lot of things in the mill right now about uh, short-term rentals. We'll just call them STRs. Uh, mm -hmm. and kind of a sister to that, ADUs, uh, accessory dwelling units, um, that so many towns in the valley are facing. And uh, these things can start getting pretty complicated when you start putting a lot of uh, these short-term rentals in the middle of residential areas. Um, developing a Good ordinance on STRs is a time-consuming process, and this is where a lot of moratoriums are usually enacted uh, to, uh, I think it took Del Nord about well over a year to enact their STR. So watch did it in about six months or so. Uh, Crestone's working on it presently. Alamosa's got uh, a lot of issues with STRs. Uh, and you will probably feel that pressure sooner or later. So uh, these are things that we probably need to work on in the planning commission and the zoning too. Um, we talked about the situation on uh, between 2nd and 3rd Avenues in the uh, business um, district zoning and uh, I suggested perhaps a solution that might uh, really satisfy all the concerns out there because you've got a nice clean zoning line there right now for business. Uh, whereas if you try to uh, divide that up between residences and, uh, and business with a zoning line, you're going to get something that looks like a line on a polygraph, you know. Um, and uh, you can uh, actually recognize the, biz, the zoning district as it is, and yet provide also by a simple code amendment, uh, the uh, residential portion still being subject to the same residential zoning that it was before this without, without disturbing the zoning line. So that's something to think about as a possible solution there. Uh, I can see that we're going to be working on murals in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. You got 30 days. 
Thirty. Thirty <laughs> <laughs> weeks. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to see it in two weeks. But. Yeah. <laughs> Martha <laughs> wants it tomorrow morning. If possible. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, but we will be working on that also. Um, and the last thing uh, I would uh, like to do myself, uh, if you guys are amenable to that, when I come into a new situation, I like to try to have a kind of an orientation session, you might call it, a retreat, you might call it, uh, a uh, training session. I hate to call it a training session because you folks have a lot of experience here in municipal law already. Uh, but um, going through all the different aspects that you get into in municipal law and how you handle those, in other words, uh, things like uh, home rule, what it's all about, uh, the preemption rules, that kind of thing when it comes to municipal home rule, um, to uh, the mechanism for passing ordinances and codes by reference, how you do that, uh, CORA, Colorado Open Records Act, COMA, Colorado Open Meetings Law, um, uh, the ADA uh, compliance uh, things uh, that you get into, uh, it's, they're so numerous it's hard to follow a complete litany of these things, but I would be willing to devote, you know, the better part of a Saturday or uh, Friday afternoon or something like that if you folks would uh, like to engage in something like that. So I just throw that out as an offer to you that uh, you could do. And we could schedule that. Uh, it looks like the summer schedule is getting pretty tight already and we'll have things like Stampede coming up before too long, but maybe we could fit that in. Um, Seth uh, is going to be helping me. He's in my office over here uh, as an attorney, and uh, he's from Colorado. He's a native. He's been around here a long time, and uh, I'm real happy to have him. I don't know what I'd do over there, frankly, without him right now. So uh, once again, it's thank you for bringing me back. Thank you for uh, having confidence to do that. I look forward to working with the entire council. Uh, feel free to call me at any time. Hopefully it's not going to be 2 o'clock in the morning, but uh, uh, down at the office there, uh, uh, and I'll be glad to uh, try to answer any questions you got or chat with you about any situation you want. So, And I would like to be able to chat with you freely too. Do you have any questions? All right, at the moment, I do not. Anybody else? No? Surprisingly, Thanks. I don't either. What's that? Surprisingly, I don't either. <laughs> That's, thank you, Gene. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Seth, you may be thinking, what did I get myself into? <laughs> Dang you, Gene. That's a full agenda right there. Yeah. <coughs> City manager report? Let's just go home. <laughs> now up to you. <laughs> um, I met with Peg Shaw, who is, heads up our community's historical society. That's something the county, or excuse me, I'm sorry, the city does help budget, gives them a little money every year. And um, she brought in the Little Colorado Prospector that was printed back when the city celebrated its 100th anniversary back in 1986. And so she thought, instead of just tossing out the box, that she's gonna start redistributing them around town just because it provides so much history. And, and so I told her that I thought all of you would want, want to have a copy of it. She also um, talked about, they've got a brochure for a walking and driving tour around Monta Vista, and they also have a pamphlet about our historic buildings <coughs> down town. So you guys want to take a look at that, I'm happy to share. And then the um, transportation of the West Museum has reopened for the season. So they open from Memorial Day to Labor Day, 
it's ran just by volunteers and and they don't have a lot of volunteers but they are open from 11 to 3 on Tuesdays and Wednesdays it's the transportation and then their little um, the historical society building there on the grounds of the library they are open on Tuesdays and Wednesdays again from 11 to 3 and she's <clears throat> Sorry, we've got kind of a lot of dust <clears throat> going on in this building today. Um, she said they've got over 5,000 photos on, that they have on file and for people to go through. And, and so they sometimes get people in asking, you know, hey, do you have a picture of my eight, you know, great, great, great Uncle Henry? And they'll see what they can come up with. So. She was, it was very interesting and I told her that I would go, um, I would go visit and see what the, they are about. She thought that the rooms were large enough that she'd like to invite council to have a meeting with her or a meet, hold a public meeting in one of her buildings and I told her that that probably wouldn't work out since we have to record and all that kind of stuff. But she has extended the invitation for all of you guys to go by and see what they've got in store. Peg's pretty amazing. I was trying to, I don't know, I'm guessing she's probably 93-ish, trying to compare her with the, the age of my parent, what my parents would have been. Um, so it was a good visit. I want to do a shout out and thank RG Bank. They treated all the staff to a cup of coffee. And so I hope you took your coupon down and was able to, to get that cup of coffee and, and their thanks to the city for everything that we do for them. Also, the Rural Electric is having their annual meeting on Tuesday, June the 14th. If anybody's interested, we can get you registered. You know, the Rural Electric has been such a great partner with the city and so any of you want to attend. I'm sure that their staff would enjoy seeing you there. What date is that again? It's Tuesday, June the 14th. <clears throat> Registration starts around 530, but they'll do the presentation of the colors at 645 and start their business meeting at 7, and they are providing some sort of a meal, so they, they're trying to get an idea of the numbers so they can and it's out of sky high in fact he's he has booked it now for like the next five years he has saved the date for their annual meeting so that's kind of cool um, received some good news today senator hickenlooper has moved our application for the sky high um, generator generation what do you call it generator prog project uh, it has moved forward to the Homeland Security Appropriations Committee. And so it means we've made the next round. So with each step, maybe we'll, we'll hit a home run on that. And so we thank Senator Hickenlooper for doing that for the city. Um, Anita is working on electric charging stations. We've got a couple companies that have come forward and said, hey, we will make the investment and, and put them in if you can secure us some property to do it. And so we're exploring that and trying to make sure that, you know, there aren't any surprises at the end of this. But right now we're currently talking with some of them about one out at Sky High because that was part of the, the plans and so that the basics have been put in out there and then we're talking about two there at the facet parking lot behind rain Brew's building so hoping that that would keep people downtown rob <coughs> and um, the intern we're going to be having dj and myself will be att attending a water smart workshop at adam state it's for good part of Tuesday went all good part of Wednesday all day Thursday and part of Friday of this next week it's being hosted by the Sonora Institute and their their motive is to for communities to start thinking about 
enacting water smart policies into future development. And after the drought that we've had this last 20 years, I don't know if any of you have gone north and just looked at the river, you can already see rock islands. The water's done. So we're gonna go see what we can learn and become smart. And that's free of charge. Uh, we'll be on a team with Rio Grande for just Rio Grande County, so there's supposed to be two participants from South Fork and two from uh, the county. Del Norte couldn't commit anybody, so we'll be working with them. So a couple of weeks ago, we did a, a, a work session regarding Sky High and you know, finding that balance of if it, is it an event center or is it a recreation center? And so trying to decide what to do, I made the executive decision to say, okay, we're gonna have it, we're gonna put together a committee. And I've asked Jaime to pick two people. I've asked Stephanie to put, pick two people. And I picked three people. So we've got a committee, not quite yet full, but it will be a committee of nine that can hopefully, I've told both Stephanie and Jaime, <coughs> they've got to be fair and balanced people. You know, we've got to figure, see how we can't get this worked out. Um, I'm afraid, in all honesty, I would be biased. I'm not part of this committee. I've asked George Dean Felter to be the chairman, and he has accepted. And um, so we'll, we're going to charge ahead and see what we can come up with. You know, the labor is still what I'm really concerned about. And Stephanie and Oscar are really overwhelmed. We've got a, another, I mean, Saturday she's got four events at Sky High again. Everything from a rodeo to a wedding, and I don't even remember what the other two are. So she and Oscar, either today or it'll be tomorrow, stringing wedding lights off the ceiling because we really don't want people that are renting the facility out there on high ladders or lifts and the potential of, of their injury. Um, we've got, we still have an application, taking applications for a third person. And then uh, this week I put under contract a young man who is going to be taking care of some of the outside stuff that I also care about because that's the whole presentation. So he'll be pulling weeds, he'll be painting those picnic tables, he will be sweeping up the sand that gets up against the curb um, at, those, at the steps, picking up all the trash underneath the bleachers, you know, there's still constru construction trash, all the things that haven't been able to be um, addressed. So we're moving onward. These are good growing pains, but, but it is a growing pain. <laughs> and then finally, I wanted to talk about work sessions. And, um, you know, I don't know if you guys, if we can maybe come up with a regular date so that we get them on the calendar. And I think my preference would be to have a work session on the odd weeks that we don't have council meetings. But it, it's amazing. Next week, already, here it'd be an odd week, and yet on the 7th we have Urban Renewal Authority at 530, and on June 8th we have the One Cent Review Committee. So um, I sent you all a doodle poll to, with a couple dates and have not hit a home run on, on either June 6th or 15th. But a couple of the things that I want, we need to talk about is you know what we had a, a really positive audit and I want to thank Anita again for all of her work I, I think she was a little frustrated at times because when the auditor wanted to point his finger she took it a little personally <laughs> she takes great pride and, and does a wonderful job but they weren't our mistakes and and so, um, you know, the mistake that he brought up at the very beginning of his presentation, and none of you ask a question, so 
that was good. But he talked about making a correction for a, um, what do you call it, uh, when you write into the, I lost the word. What, what? The, uh, a journal entry. A journal, thank you, oh, thank okay. you, journal okay. entry. Okay. That was made in 2020. 2020 or 2019 it was made in January tw January 2020 20. it was not corrected in 2021 and he just now found it well that's really his error I mean it was a city error that it wasn't done properly but he should have caught it last year and reported it and so um, so again we've got new people it's a new day She's not taking ownership in that boo-boo. <laughs> <I'm glad. laughs> but, but the result, result is, is that you could see that we, we had some popular, um, or not popular, favorable growth. And I want to visit with you guys about putting a little money back into this building and making some capital improvements that need to be done. And Councilman Sagala talked about this white building. And you're right, it's probably been white for what, 40, 50 years? I was born here. I was Longer. sleeping in that nursery over there. <laughs> so, and I've talked with one um, architect, he's with CRHDC, and he said, you know, you could do a lot just by changing, you know, putting a couple different colors, contrasting colors on the outside and making things kind of pop a little bit. And then I thought, well, another mural on this far side. And, you know. <laughs> but um, so I, I want to, we, we need to have a thoughtful discussion about that and, and give us some direction. Um, we also need to have a discussion about how we spend our federal funding. And I've come up with a, a good list, met with staff, They've thrown in some input. Um, I'm not quite ready to, to give it to you yet, only from the standpoint of one of the, the um, recommendations, just to give you a little snapshot, is that we need to make some improvements as well to the IT side in our courtroom. Well, the estimate I got was $19,000. And I just find that unacceptable for a room that we, we use for less than 10 hours once a month. That's a lot <coughs> of money. So um, I called a, a friend down at the state courts. And she said, Gigi, we're state. <laughs> we're not municipal. But she reminded me of a, a man that I worked with um, when we built the Justice Center in Alamosa. And I called Tom today. And he said, he said, Gigi, that's a lot of money for a room that's used that little. He said, I might even have the stuff that you need that you can get this done. So I wanna, want to make sure that we kind of have some other ideas poked into this so that out of our ARC funding, you guys are saying, yeah, spend that 19,000 on, on uh, the courtroom if we can come up with a much lesser investment that will get us basically the same results so but i still want to get moving on that we need you know time is somewhat of the ex essence we don't have to get it all spent but we have to have it all earmarked and um and we still have time on that as well but on some of this stuff and what we're finding with trying to get contractors to give bids and and such they are all so busy, and so we just need to get our name on the list so we can move forward on some of this. And I think that's it. Dear Council, any questions? Thank you for what all you do. I know you're busy. I see your car down here on Fridays. And I think I actually see you here on Sunday. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, Gigi. I appreciate your devotion to the city. We're going to get there. Amen. Together. Together. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. you bet. Council Committee.
Community City Commission Council reports. <coughs> Martha? Okay. Well, pull up my notes here. Um, I want to start with um, maybe just something to consider for planning and zoning. That board did just grow from two to five. So there are, you know, people on there that have a passion and a desire to serve, but I don't think a little education would hurt them. I don't think it would hurt us either. Maybe we could do it. Mr. Wilbers Wilkinson came and did a PNC 101. Is so, that, do I have the right person? So uh, Mr. Wilkinson did an economic development 101 and then Department of Local Affairs did a planning and zoning 101. Okay, so we do have resources for some continuing edu education and I think that would be um, beneficial to planning and zoning and to us. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to see if we can look into that and, and, and check that out a little bit. Because I, I want to see our planning and zoning succeed, but we can't just say, okay, you're on planning and zoning, sink or swim. So what other type of training then are you thinking about? You know, I don't know enough about planning and zoning to know what sort of tra So 101, <laughs> you know, let's just start there. <laughs> Well, we kind of had that one already. <laughs> well, okay. Well, what's going to what's going to add to the economic health of our city? What's going to help? What's going to add to the? Uh, I hate to use mental health, but I meant what I mean is what's going to what's going to add to the our citizens having pride in their city? You know, just just what's going to lift us up? You know, what 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 can we do to be to be lifted up and, and encouraged and, you know, we're already seeing some good things, but planning and zoning has a, has a major role in that. That's just something I want to toss out there for consideration. I'm not asking, I'm not formally asking for it. I'm asking for it to be considered. Yeah. Well, that kind of helps give me some ideas on what we can at least. Sure. It will, you know, what works in small rural towns? You know, what, what has worked, what has not worked. Um, maybe some case studies so we can see some examples of where a, a rural town tried something and it fail, failed miserably. So we don't want to do that. And something where a rural town tried something and it was extremely successful. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. We can follow that model. Well, and there's some of that stuff already that, like CML, if you guys, mm -hmm. if you guys would look at your little flyers and... <laughs> <laughs> right, but planning and zoning, I don't think is going to CML. So, no, they don't. But I mean, there's a lot of um, they do a lot of case study examples. Right, and and we can share that with them as well. And okay, just so, just something. I, I again, I just don't want these people that we have um, that I th that I think are fantastic people, or I wouldn't have been in favor of putting them on planning and zoning. But that doesn't mean they know everything there is to know about planning and zoning. Sure. And I don't know everything there is about anything. Pick a subject. I don't know all of it. Um, there is a military send-off. It's already been mentioned it, uh, this coming Saturday, I believe. If you have never had the opportunity to go to one of these ceremonies, please go. It doesn't take a long time, but it is touching. It is thought provoking. You look at these young people and you realize what they're, you look at the world around us. You know, they're not just going to boot camp, they are standing up and they are doing something absolutely incredible and they're willing to lay their lives down for it. Wow. That's a big thing when you, you know, you look at this young person and you realize they've already made that decision. Um, and, and then you get to talk with them. And the whole idea of, let me make sure I got the, mili make sure I got the name right. of proud military parents and supporters is 
is bringing awareness that when a young person goes off like this, yes, it's important that their families support them, but it means so much to them know that their community, where they grew up, is behind them too. And, and, and we can be that community. We can be that, you know, and, and they do all sorts of different things. They send care packages. One of the things that they're doing, um, I don't mean to be rude with my phone, but some of my notes are on here. Um, on June 16th at 7 p.m. at the Valley Theater, uh, they're going to be playing Taking Chance. And it's a, and the donations that are accepted, uh, funds will be going towards care package for our care packages for our local military men and women at Christmas. Um, and there will be several second chance drawings that will take place after the movie. I'm not really sure what that means, but they do and maybe y'all do. <clears throat> so anyway, I really want to encourage you to support that organization, support what they do, support our young people uh, making this decision, making this commitment. Support them now. And, and not, not to be dreary, but we may not see them again to support them again. We pray for something different, but we need to face that reality. So we need to say goodbye to them and that we're behind them. Uh, and then I've got, um, oh, I, I did a, I talked to some people, did some social media, I just kind of did a, I'm really proud of Monta Vista. And I'm proud to live here and work here. If you don't share that, I mean, I can't remember exactly how it worded. If you don't share that, what are some of your ideas? And there were a lot of them. And y'all can go and look at that. But one of them really stuck out. And it seems to relate to something that happened in the meeting tonight. Um, our public works department, Rob said, is not ready for summer. No fault to your own. No fault of your own at all. We've had we've got we've had a little bit going on, so get it. But one of the people suggested that some some cities, some small towns, offer apprenticeships for young people, and they work for the whole summer. They get a small stipend, um, thousand somewhere between a thousand fifteen hundred dollars, you know, for working that whole summer as an apprentice. If that would help any department in our city, not just public works, I'm not picking on Rob, because uh, I think Rob's doing a fantastic job. He's just had a lot of other things to do, like cleaning up a fire scene. But maybe that would give, you know, a little, a little bit of pocket money to some young people that maybe they're saving up for their first car, or maybe they saving up for you know their dorm at college or I don't know what their reasons are maybe they want to blow it on video games I don't care but it puts them in a working environment where they're learning something they're learning a trade of some at least they're, if nothing else they're learning a job that they they don't want ever want to do again you know and sometimes as we go through life that's some of the biggest lessons we can learn is, okay, don't want to do that again. Move on. And, but, but they get paid for it, and they're taught a work ethic. And I would expect anyone that they served under to teach them a very good, and, and by example, show them a good work ethic. You know, maybe somebody wants to be an, an accountant. Maybe Anita could help them out. I, 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 this is just a suggestion. And then the last thing is, um, you know, I'm just super stinking excited about all the summer events that are, that are coming up. And what makes me so excited about that is not only are they events that have been traditional, like Stampede, Potato Fest, I'm assuming we're going to have Potato Fest, um, but we have got, in this town right now, we have got citizens stepping up. They're not waiting for the government to do it. They're not waiting for the chamber to do it. They're not waiting for the historical society to do it or, you know, URA or anything. They're stepping up. One woman has created a third Friday art walk. She's got a lot of volunteers behind her. 
you know, we've we've got the optimistics have well they started this last year, but it's sort of an annual it's sort of sort of already a, an assumed annual thing is Cinco de Mayo and and um, the beer fest and car show in cooperation with Poor Boys doing the car show. You know, so these and and these are all just people that just started doing something, got out there and started trying, and other people joined in with them. And now we have citizens doing things. And that right there is one of the reasons I'm so proud of Monta Vista and Monta Vista citizens. Um, oh, and, and the lady that, that started the whole mural project. I don't know if she's doing all of these, if she has, you know, done all these or if other people are gonna step up, but I'm sure other people will. So I see that growing. I, I see the, the beautific beautification downtown growing, and I think that's a very important thing. Those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. I know there's a lot of other people doing a lot of other things. I'm just, I'm just like I said, just a stinking proud to see that. I can't stand it. So, Way to go, Monta Vista, and uh, thank you all for allowing me to have an excused absence last meeting. That's the first one I've missed in almost two and a half years, and it felt very odd. I couldn't wait to watch the video because I felt like I really missed out. Um, but I appreciate that. It was my daughter's graduation, and given the choice between that and pretty much anything else in the world, I was not going to miss her graduation. So, <laughs> that's my report. Thank you. Gotcha. Mr. Foster. I'll be short and sweet. Gigi, in reference to a previous email, keep saying the word opportunity. And Mr. Farish, welcome. I don't have anything. <clears throat> I'm good. We're good. <laughs> Monty Strong, thank you all very much. We'll have more discussion at another, another time. We will recess this meeting to... Uh, June 16th at 6 p.m.